And now for the participants tonight. First and foremost, on my left, a man who holds the titles of a professor, director, author, minister. And when I found out of all the different things that this gentleman does, I thought, when does he have time to eat, to sleep, some of the normal things that we do as human beings? He, he will bring us the Protestant viewpoint tonight. He's a professor at Grand Canyon University, a College of Christian Studies, and that's in Arizona, director of Alpha and Omega Ministries for Christian Apologetics, and an ordained Baptist minister. Let's welcome James White. And on my right, a gentleman who has really seen both sides of the fence, I guess you could say. He went from being a student at Jimmy Swaggart Bible College to being a student on the road to the Roman Catholic priesthood. That's a, quite a, a different term there. He will present the Catholic viewpoint tonight. Uh, raised a Baptist and became a, a youth pastor in the Assemblies of God. He's a convert to Catholicism. He is currently Director of Apologetics for St. Joseph Radio and a youth minister here in the Diocese of Orange. Let's welcome Tim Staples. This evening's moderator, Father Hugh Barber, as uh, you may guess, is a Catholic priest, and he, too, is a convert to Catholicism, coming over from uh, the Episcopal Church. And I do want to ask you, Father, what possessed you to take on such a chore tonight? What possessed you to take this on tonight? Obedience. Obedience, he says. Okay. <laughs> Father Barber is going to lead us in an opening prayer, and I'd just like you to give an extra warm welcome to our moderator, Father Hugh Barber. Let us pray. Eternal and most merciful Father, you are truth. You can neither deceive nor be deceived. All that you have revealed to us through your Son is true. We ask you to hear his prayer, the prayer which the Apostle tells us he ever lives to make in your presence as our great High Priest. Hear the prayer which he makes for us at this hour in the presence and united to all of the elect, the citizens of heaven, who are looking upon us with interest. He prayed, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth, that they may be one. Grant us, O Heavenly Father, that unity of heart and mind, which is founded upon your word, your word which stands forever. We ask this grace for ourselves, trusting that surely you hear the prayers of those whose sole desire is to bring their brethren to eternal life. We ask this prayer as we ask all of our prayers in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, world without end. So, we have the opening statements, the 25 minute limit, and I've told Mr. Staples that I'm going to be a little harder on him because of the obvious suspicion that might arise from my uh, clear theological point of view. <laughs> but I'd like to reassure Mr. White that I have a cousin, a dear cousin, a first cousin, who is a Southern Baptist minister, and I was a guest in his home just uh, three short weeks ago in North Carolina. So uh, I uh, could claim a title to favoritism on the other side as well. And so now we can begin. And uh, I trust that everything will move smoothly according to that providential work of God, which of course is what we are all about here.
It is good to be with you this evening. I especially want to thank all of you local folks for importing Phoenix weather for me to make me feel very much at home. Um, you didn't need to do that. Uh, I was sort of looking forward to something uh, under 90 degrees, but uh, I'm glad that you're here this evening. And I congratulate you on making the good choice. The things that we discussed this evening are eternal things. They are important things. They are things that many people in our culture today do not appreciate and and do not take time to think about. And I hope that you will think very, very closely this evening about what is said. There is <coughs> very little time, unfortunately, for us to even begin to say what we want to say. You are the judges of this debate. You will need to go from here and do some work. You will need to look up passages. You may need to do some homework. I challenge you to do so. If you do not leave here this evening uh, with things to think about, then I think both Mr. Staples and I have failed in our tasks before you this evening. Long ago, a man <clears throat> named Theodoret, one of the early fathers of the church, wrote a book in which he presented a dialogue between an orthodox believer and one who had been led astray. At one point in the conversation, Theodoret gives us an important truth when he has one of his imaginary disputants utter these words. The doctrine of the church should be proven, not announced. Therefore, show that the scriptures teach these things. I come this evening in the spirit of this ancient writer, not merely to announce to you some doctrine on my own authority, but to prove the truth of the doctrine of sola scriptura and to show that the scriptures do in fact teach their own sufficiency to act as the sole infallible rule of faith of the church. I contrast my position with that found in the popular Roman Catholic writer John O'Brien, who has written, quote, Great as is our reverence for the Bible, reason and experience compel us to say that it alone is not a competent nor a safe guide as to what we are to believe, end quote. I hope Mr. Staples will tell us if he likewise views the Bible as John O'Brien did in those words. Now, I want you to understand from the very beginning that there are two positions being presented here this evening, not just one. There are two positions being presented. I believe in sola scriptura that the scriptures, the God-breathed revelation of the Almighty himself, is the sole infallible rule of faith for the church. But unfortunately, many of these debates are marred by the fact that people don't recognize there are two positions up here this evening. And I am going to assert and prove and know that my friend Tim is going to take umbrage to this, that the other position being presented could be described as sola ecclesia that the church is the ultimate authority in all things. But I want you to think as to why I present it in this way. The Roman Catholic position is that the church defines the extent of Scripture in the canon. The church give, tells you what the text means, gives you the guidelines. Is the, the role of interpretation is reserved to the church. So what Scripture is and what Scripture says is ultimately determined by the ecclesia, the church. And the church also tells you what is and what is not tradition. The church defines this is tradition, this is not tradition. And then the church tells you what tradition does and does not mean. So if you have an entity that defines the extent of Scripture and the meaning of Scripture, the extent of tradition and the meaning of tradition, then I would say that entity is, in fact, your ultimate and final authority, unquestionable. And that means you have two ultimate authorities being presented to you this evening. Mine is the Theanustos, God-breathed scriptures, the term that Paul uses when he writes to Timothy and says all scripture is Theanustos, God-breathed. And then you have the assertion that the church is the final authority, that yes, the Bible is God-breathed. Mr. Staples believes that, and I appreciate that. It makes the debate a whole lot easier. And he also believes that tradition, from what he told me on the Bible Answer Man show just a couple days ago, is likewise inspired. And yet both are defined and interpreted by one ultimate authority, and that is the church. And I know that my friend Mr. Staples is going to try to say, no, that's not what we believe, but I will make this assertion right now, that every argument that is going to be presented to say, no, we don't believe in sola ecclesia, will in fact prove my point. Now... It is vital to remember this throughout this debate. As we start throwing things around and as questions come up, it is important to remember 
that one must remember there are two positions here and an argument that one side uses against the other. If it is applied to one's own position and causes a problem, that is an inconsistent argument. If Mr. Staples, for example, argues that, well, sola scriptura uh, doesn't lead to a unanimity of opinion and therefore it can't be true, then I'm going to respond, well, sola ecclesia doesn't either. You have all sorts of different opinions. If the argument uses, used against sola scriptura refutes it, then why doesn't it refute your own position? And you cannot use arguments that would refute your own position against someone else's. Both sides need to keep that in mind. Now, the doctrine of sola scriptura is really rather straightforward. But in my experience, it is rarely represented accurately in most situations. Sola scriptura, briefly stated, is simply this. Because the scriptures are the only example of God-breathed revelation, the possession of the church, they form the only infallible rule of faith for the church. In other words, since the Bible is theonoustos, God-breathed, as Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.16, it provides to us the very voice and speaking of God, just as Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 22, verse 31. God's voice can admit of no higher or equal authority. It is the ultimate authority in all things, for God cannot refer to any higher authority than himself to establish the truthfulness of what he says. It is, by definition, our absolute authority. Sola Scriptura denies that there is another infallible rule of faith in the church. There may be other rules that we utilize, subordinate standards. But they are always and must be subject to the correction of the highest authority, that is Scripture. As Augustine put it, what more shall I teach you than what we read in the Apostle? For Holy Scripture fixes the rule for our doctrine, lest we dare to be wiser than we ought. Therefore, I should not teach you anything else except to expound to you the words of the teacher. And again, elsewhere, he put it this way. Neither dare one agree with Catholic bishops if by chance they err in anything with the result that their opinion is against the canonical scriptures of God. Now, it's important, I think, to define what sola scriptura is not. Sola scriptura is not a denial that God's word has at times been in oral form during those times of inscripturation. Nor the normative situation of the church, which is where we are today, is what we're addressing in regards to Sola Scriptura. We do not have revelation coming today. The Roman Catholic agrees. It's not like the Mormons who have an open canon of Scripture. God has revealed His Word. Now in the situation where God has revealed His Word, what is the ultimate authority for the church? It is not a denial of the role of the Holy Spirit in leading and guiding the church. In fact, it is an integral part of what Protestants have always believed to emphasize that the Holy Spirit of God must be active in a person's heart to have a proper understanding and a desire to even be obedient to the Word of God. It is not an assertion that the Bible contains all knowledge. Very, very often, Sola Scriptura is misrepresented by Roman Catholic writers by referring, for example, to John 21, 25, saying, well, there are many things that Jesus did that are not contained in Scripture. That has nothing to do whatsoever with Sola Scriptura. Sola Scriptura is not a claim that we have all knowledge. We do not know how the apostles dressed each day. We don't know what they ate at each meal. Neither do we need to know. The scriptures are sufficient for particular purposes. They're not an exhaustive catalog of all religious knowledge. And since the doctrine of the soul of scripture has never claimed that, it is a misrepresentation to attack it on that basis. Furthermore, it is not an assertion that we can learn nothing from the generations that have gone before. It is not a claim that we have to go back, as my opponent has alleged in the past, 2,000 years and reinvent the wheel with each generation. We can learn many things from what God has done with his church over the past generations, but the ultimate authority for every generation is always the scriptures and never the church. There are also a lot of common misunderstandings about the doctrine that we should dismiss immediately. For example, I would say the single worst argument against sola scriptura goes something along these lines. Sola scriptura is the blueprint for anarchy. 
Look at what has happened. There are 23,000 Protestant denominations. Sola Scriptura is an utter failure. Well, if Sola Scriptura claimed that by having a sufficient source of revelation from God, everybody is going to become sinless, abandon all their traditions, read everything there is in Scripture, be fair with it, then that might be a decent argument. But that's not what Sola Scriptura says. You see, the misuse of a sufficient source is not a valid argument against that source. A very good friend of mine recently expressed it in this way. Many of you are, are undoubtedly entering into the computer age, and let's say you got a new printer. I did just recently. And you're given a printer manual, and the guy says, well, follow the instructions here, and everything will work fine. Well, you're a little impatient. None of you out here may, I may be the only one who has this problem. You're a little impatient, and you don't want to read through that whole thing and read all that technique and so on and so forth. So you just sort of start putting things together, and lo and behold, uh, strange characters start coming out of your printer. It won't stop, and uh, your computer screen's flashing, and you've got a problem. And you go back to the people who sold you the computer, and they say, well, did you follow the instructions? Well, uh, no, I didn't really, didn't really read all of that stuff there, you know. And they take your computer back, and they follow the instructions and put everything together. It works just fine. Now, was there something wrong with the manual because you didn't follow it? Of course not. The manual was sufficient for the purpose for which it was designed. The fact that you didn't read it or didn't understand it or were impatient or thought you knew more than the manual could tell you is not the fault of the manual. In the same way, just because someone says, I believe the Bible, and then goes off and teaches some strange thing, has nothing to do with the sufficiency of the Bible to lead us to God's truth and the functions of soul and style of the rule of faith of the church. There are people who pick up the documents of Vatican II and come up with all sorts of wacky ideas. Does that make the documents of Vatican II somehow bad? Insufficient? You see, if that argument could be used both ways, it's not a good argument. Most obviously, sola scriptura does not claim that there will be a unanimity of opinion simply because God has given us his word. Even in the days of the apostles, there were those who twisted the scriptures to their own destruction. Even when the apostles were alive. John had to write against Gnosticism and, and Docetism. Paul had to write against the Judaizers in Galatia. Certainly no one would argue that these apostles were insufficient as teachers. And yet, there, the presence of perfectly sufficient teachers did not result in a unanimity of opinion, did it? No, it didn't. Now, historic Protestants have always asserted that there are difficult passages in the Bible, things that are hard to understand, and that we must apply our minds and our hearts to be diligent students of the Word. The Scriptures command us to do this. Protestants believe that God will hold each man and woman responsible for his truth. We will not be able to say, well, such and so a person told me or such a group told me to believe this. In the final judgment, that excuse will not work. But it's just here the battle is engaged. A few days ago when Mr. Staples and I were on the Bible Answer Man show, Mr. Staples became rather animated at one point, and I'm glad that uh, he believes in what he believes and can become animated. It's better than those dry folks who don't seem to really care too much about what they're talking about. And we'll be animated this evening. But at one point he said, look, we don't just have a book. We have a living church. And later on he said, we have a man that can walk into a room and say, thus saith God. Now, I don't think what Mr. Staples meant was he can give revelation. But that he can interpret the revelation that has been given. But it's that phrase, we don't just have a book. Mr. Staples, neither do I. Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is alive and powerful. It can discern the thoughts and tents of the heart. It's not just a book. It's God breathed. It's God speaking to us. And in Matthew 20, chapter 22, Jesus holds men accountable for what the scriptures say as if God had spoken those words directly to them. Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses have an ultimate authority. Someone who can say, thus saith the Lord... But you don't follow them. You see, Mr. Staples, you made a fallible decision when you chose your ultimate authority. You had choices you could make. The Mormons will offer you an ultimate authority. 
Jehovah's Witnesses will offer you an ultimate authority. But it is your decision to choose which of these ultimate authorities you're going to choose, and that is a fallible decision. And for those of you who are seeking for infallible certainty, you can never have more infallible certainty than that choice when you make that decision for what your ultimate authority is going to be. I'm very straightforward with what mine is. Mine's the Scriptures. And we'll discuss more about what that means as we develop this subject. Well, someone might say, yes, but we have the living church. The church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. I remember reading in, uh, in a book that Mr. Staples liked a lot called Surprised by Truth. Someone saying that as a Protestant, they were shocked when they first read 1 Timothy 3.15. And I was shocked that any Protestant could ever be shocked at 1 Timothy 3.15. The church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. There are pillars alongside here. There's hopefully, seemingly since this place has survived a lot of earthquakes, a very good foundation underneath this place this evening. But what does a pillar and foundation do? It's holding up that roof above you, folks. Aren't you glad it is? The church isn't the truth. The church presents and preaches the truth. A pillar and a foundation holds something else up. And what does the church do? The church, as the obedient bride of Christ, listens to the word of Christ that comes to her in that which is theanustos, that which is God-breathed, the Scriptures. She does not replace them. She does not elevate herself to where she is in control of them, where she defines them. She proclaims them. But only the scriptures are theonustos. The church is not God-breathed. And Mr. Staples claims that tradition, whatever that might be, and we'll need to get into that, is inspired. And one of his favorite passages, I've listened to many of his, those of you who are with St. Joseph's Catholic Radio, you'll be glad to know that you, you have someone who listens to you frequently on bike rides out in Phoenix, Arizona, out in the middle of the desert. One of his favorite passages to prove this point is 2 Thessalonians 2.15. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. See, it's right there. Hold to the traditions. There you have the two sources. You've got the oral traditions. You've got the written scriptures, Roman Catholicism, and its doctrine of authority in all its glory, right? No. In no way. First of all, note, if you have your Bibles with you, what is said in the passage? First of all, there is one body of truth in view here, delivered in two ways, by preaching and by letter. Remember, Paul had preached to the Thessalonians, and he's referring to the preaching that he had delivered to them and the letter that he had written to them, which we call First Thessalonians. Notice also the entire church, not just the bishop. The entire church at Thessalonica had already been taught these items, these traditions. These are not, then, teachings that are limited to the bishops, but are generally known truths that every person in the church knew and believed. Hence, any claim that the oral component contains anything other than what is found in the written component requires the defender of such a position to prove from the writings of the early church itself that these things, these traditions, were generally known and believed by the Christian people. We will see that when we look at the doctrines that have been infallibly and clearly defined by Rome on the basis of tradition, that these doctrines are uniformly, utterly unknown in the early church. But all of this involves a gross misreading of the text in the first place. Paul is in no way talking about some extra scriptural revelation in this passage. Instead, when we read the passage in its own immediate context, we find he is talking about something much more easily defined than some oral traditions, whatever they might be. He's talking about the gospel. Paul taught the Thessalonians what? The gospel. Both in person as well as by his first letter to the Thessalonians. This can be seen by the fact that the term Paul uses here in 2 Thessalonians 2.15 when exhorting us to stand firm in these traditions is used by Paul elsewhere in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13 when he says to stand firm in the faith. 
Paul is not giving us a command here to hold to oral traditions. He is giving us a command to hold to the gospel which he had preached to them. As my time is fleeting, I want to point out my favorite example from the past. I teach church history, and I, I like to point out one particular individual. There's a saying from church history, Athanasius contra mundum, Athanasius against the world. The great bishop of Alexandria, Athanasius, at one point in his life find him, found himself standing literally against the entire world. About the year 340, between 340 and 350, during the Arian Ascendancy after the Council of Nicaea, where the Nicene faith that we would all, I would assume here this evening, agree with, the Nicene faith was under attack. In fact, the majority of the bishops in the church and the councils that were being held denied it or moderated it or compromised it. But there was this one diehard guy down there in Alexandria, kicked out of his church five times, one time by 5,000 soldiers, coming in the back door while he was going out, going out the other side. His name was Athanasius. At one point in time, and I would like Mr. Staples to address this, at one point in time, if you could put himself, yourself in his context, he stood against the majority, the vast majority, of bishops, priests, monks, and church councils that had ever been held. But he said, you're all wrong. You're all wrong. Tremendously Protestant thing to do, I would say. Why would Athanasius do that? He's a bishop in the church. Might it be because he taught these words? Let this then, Christ-loving man, be our offering to you just for a rudimentary sketch and an outline and a short compass of the faith of Christ and of his divine appearing usward. But you, taking occasion by this, if you light upon the text of the Scriptures, by genuinely applying your mind to them, you will learn from them more completely and clearly the exact detail of what we have said. For they were spoken and written by God through men who spoke for God. Rather than finding O'Brien's idea that Scripture is not a safe guide as to what we are to believe, Athanasius said, quote, For the tokens of truth are more exact as drawn from Scripture than from other sources. End quote. These other sources for him included church councils such as that of Nicaea, which Athanasius defended so strongly. He also said, but since Holy Scripture is of all things most sufficient for us, therefore recommending to those who desire to know more of these matters to read the divine word, I now hasten to set before you that which most claims attention and for the sake of which principally I have written these things and then these words. For indeed the holy and God-breathed Scriptures are self-sufficient for the preaching of the truth. Is that why Athanasius could stand against even the forced retraction and collapse of the Bishop of Rome in his day and stand for the truth that Jesus Christ is fully God because he knew that all the councils on earth and all the bishops on earth could not change God's truth found in his holy word. That is why Augustine could say, I don't care if all the Catholic bishops agree, if their opinion is against this, don't follow it. And that is what I'm presenting to you this evening. The scriptures are God-breathed. If Mr. Staples wants to win this debate, it's very easy. The thesis is the scriptures are the only infallible rule of faith for the church. He agrees the scriptures are infallible, right? I believe, believe that's what he said. I don't want to misrepresent him. He believes they're God-breathed. We don't have to argue about that part. So we believe the Bible is God-breathed, it's infallible, it's a rule of faith for the church. All Mr. Staples has to do is show us another Theonustos God-breathed infallible rule of faith for the church. But it obviously can't be the church itself, can it? The church can't be her own rule. There are the issues before you. Keep them in mind clearly. Open your Bibles if you have them. Take notes. Join with us as we begin this time together of seriously considering the sufficiency of God's Word. Thank you.
thank you, and please, um, if we could, please, if we could uh, withhold applause. I would like to thank you all for coming out to our discussion. I'm uh, really happy to see so many friendly faces here, but I, I want to just remind us that the issues that we're talking about this evening are very serious. We're talking about eternal life and eternal death here. These issues are absolutely crucial, and I pray for your undivided attention, not only for myself, but also for James. I want you to listen to what he is saying. In fact, I recommend getting some of his books, such as The Roman Catholic Controversy. And I recommend you read those Catholics to hear the arguments as they are presented from the other side on this issue. We need to be well-versed, I believe, in the arguments that are coming the other way because there are many Catholics who are being deceived or being led away from the Most Blessed Sacrament because of slick arguments, misrepresentations of Church Fathers as well as Sacred Scriptures. So I would like to begin my, my, my opening talk Actually, I took a little turn here because I was a bit taken aback at my opponent's quotation from St. Athanasius. And this is a great example, folks, of exactly what I warn my students, those of you that are here, against. That is taking a quote from a father or from Scripture out of context in order to create or shoehorn a doctrine. That's what we cannot do. Let me quote to you from St. Athanasius in his four letters to Serapion. My opponent has just presented the novel idea that St. Athanasius, a Catholic bishop, taught sola scriptura. Let me quote to you St. Athanasius himself. Yes, St. Athanasius believed that the scriptures are inspired. They're authoritative. They are a rule of faith. We believe that as Catholics. But folks, listen, and you be the judge what St. Athanasius teaches. Listen, these sayings... And this is after Athanasius has gone through a number of scriptures when he is writing against the Arian heresy. These saints concerning the Holy Spirit by themselves alone show that in nature and essence he has nothing in common with or proper to creatures, but is distinct from things originate proper to and not alien from the Godhead and essence of the Son, in virtue of which essence and nature he is the Holy Triad. Now, if you stopped right there, You'd say, my, 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 St. Athanasius believes in Sola Scriptura. But if I were to do that, I would be dishonest, because I would not be presenting to you St. Athanasius in completion. Let me read the next line. But beyond these scriptural sayings, let us look at the very tradition, teaching, and faith of the Catholic Church from the beginning, which the Lord gave, please, no, please, Gave from the beginning which the Lord gave, the apostles preached, and the fathers kept. Upon this the church is founded, and he who should fall away from it should not be a Christian and should no longer be so called. So yes, St. Athanasius taught the inspiration of Scripture, as all Catholics do. Let me quote to you from the documents of Vatican II and set the record straight what the Catholic Church really teaches. In De Verbum, I'll read paragraphs 9 and 10. For both of them, that is, Scripture and tradition, flowing out of the same wellspring, come together in some fashion to form one thing and move towards the same goal. Sacred Scripture is the speech of God. There you have it, folks. We Catholics believe that the Word of God is theopneustos. It is the Word of God. God breathed as it is put down in writing under the breath of the Holy Spirit, and tradition transmits in its entirety the Word of God, which has been entrusted to the apostles by Christ the Lord and the Holy Spirit. Sacred tradition and sacred scripture make up one single sacred deposit of faith, of the Word of God, which is entrusted to the church. My opponent has just told you that the Roman Catholic Church teaches sola ecclesia. I am amazed. In fact, I'm convinced that if the Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, were to come in here and argue with this guy and say, excuse me, the Catholic Church doesn't teach that, he would be quick to correct Pope John Paul II. In fact, we do not teach that. We teach, as I have just read, the Scripture is inspired as its tradition. They form one revelation, one deposit of faith. The Church is not above the Scriptures. 
That is not true. That is not what we teach. But we do teach the church is the bride of Christ. She is our mother. And as such, she has authority over the children, just like in the family. She has authority over the children to tell them what daddy says. That is what the Catholic Church teaches. And I'm going to present to you folks proof beyond a shadow of a doubt this evening that this, in fact, is the teaching of sacred scripture. I'm going to demonstrate that sola scriptura is not historical, it is not biblical, and it is not reasonable, nor is it workable. Now, I could give more quotes where my opponent has taken fathers out of context, but I will pass for now. But somehow I think we may return to that later. And let me proceed to the second point, that is, not only is Sola Scripture not historical, no Christian taught, no Christian taught Sola Scripture for the first 1,300 years of Christianity. But it is also not biblical. And I will begin in the Old Testament. Now, clearly, folks, what we see in sacred Scripture, and I don't need to go over all of these verses. Mr. White would agree with me. Deuteronomy 4.2, Deuteronomy 29.19, Deuteronomy 28.58, Deuteronomy 13.1, Joshua 1.8. We could go over a litany of scriptures that demonstrate that the Word of God is binding on the consciences of believers in the Old Testament. We agree. However, what we also see in the Old Testament is the orally spoken Word of God that is equally as binding on the consciences of believers. Excuse me if I do get a little animated. Second Chronicles chapter 12, verse 5. Then Shemaiah, and I quote, Shemaiah the prophet came to Rehoboam and the commanders of Judah had gathered at Jerusalem and said, Thus saith the Lord. Notice, the response. The response isn't, well, you know, it's great that you said that and all, but we've got to wait till it's written down before we uh, obey it. Of course not. And I don't think Mr. White is trying to say that. But what I think Mr. White is misrepresenting is when that word of God is spoken, it is the word of God. It abides forever and it binds all believers, whether it is written down or not. In fact, the majority of there are a large number of prophets we could go through Elijah, Elijah, in fact, Shemaiah that I just quoted, who never wrote a lick. Yet the word they spoken was binding on the consciences of believers. And we could go through this litany of scriptures I have for the spoken word of God being equally the word of God. It is just as much the word of God as the written word of God is. But I want to get to my third point in the Old Testament. We also see a teaching authority, not that Lord's over the scriptures, as my opponent has attempted to say the Catholic Church teaches, which she does not. But what we see is a magisterium, an Old Testament version, of a teaching authority that tells the people of God what, in fact, the Word of God and the tradition is. Deuteronomy 17, 8 through 12. The Scripture says very plainly, if, if you perceive trouble between blood and blood, cause and cause, Go to the Bible, get it out, and start arguing passages. Is that what it says? No. It says, go to the priest or the judge or the one whom the Lord has placed in authority over you. And notice, he that will not hear the word of the priest or the judge or the one whom the Lord has placed over you will be put to death. Does that sound like Sola Scriptura to you? Exodus chapter 28, verse 30, we read, In the breast piece of decision, you shall put the urim and thummim. Now, what in the world is urim and thummim? Is that something to eat? The urim and the thummim. What is that? This is a scripture talking about the high priest who had the urim and the thummim in his breast piece of decision, as it's called. And what is it there for? That they may be over Aaron's heart whenever he enters the presence of the Lord. Thus, he shall always bear the decisions of the Israelites over his heart in the Lord's presence. He had authority, the high priest, to hear from God and to direct the people of God. That, my friends, is what a magisterium is all about. And I want you to notice further that in Matthew 23, verses 1 and 2, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, acknowledges this authority that he himself established as God in the Old Testament. In Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 and 2, and I quote, Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees, what? Sit in the chair of Moses. Where does that come from? Well, the material principle is Exodus 28, 30. 
We have an authority established as well as Deuteronomy 17. However, this is a tradition preserved in the church that Jesus acknowledges as such. And notice what he says to the apostles. He says, The scribes and Pharisees sit in the chair of Moses, all things therefore whatsoever they shall say, observe and do. Do what they say. That's a commandment to the apostles. But according to their works, do not. I know many of my Protestant friends out there are, you're just biting at the bit and you're saying, man, I can't wait. I want that question from Matthew chapter 15, where Jesus condemns the traditions of men from the, uh, from the same Pharisees and priests, doesn't it? Well, notice Jesus makes a distinction that you'll do well to remember tonight because you're going to hear it again. Jesus makes a distinction between the traditions of men and Catholics, please remember this. We have Catholics in the church, James. We have the same problem they had in the Old Testament. We have Catholics who want to exalt their own teachings, their own traditions with a small p above the traditions of the church. And that is wrong. It's always been wrong, always will be. But notice, Jesus does not condemn all tradition. He doesn't even condemn all tradition that purports to be coming from God. He condemns the traditions of men that purport to come from God, but here he acknowledges the tradition of the Old Testament church when it is spoken authoritatively from the chair of Moses. In John chapter 11, verses 47 through 52, folks, please read these verses. If you're Protestant here, if you're Catholic, please read these verses. John chapter 11, verses 47 through 52, we are present at the council of the Pharisees and priests who were gathered to decide how they, how they were going to get rid of Jesus. And when they were gathered, Caiaphas, being the high priest, hey, that's the guy with the urn and the thumb. And notice he's a very wicked man. And my opponent will point out, oh, there have been a lot of bad popes. Yeah, there have been a few. Alexander the Sixth is not a guy I'd have had over for dinner. But that has no bearing whatsoever on infallibility as... This fellow, Caiaphas, though he was the the epitome of evil, he was about to put Jesus Christ to death. Notice what happens. He stands up in the middle of the council and says, You know nothing, nor do you consider that it is better for you that one man should die instead of the people, that the whole nation perish not. And notice what John says. John says, parenthetically, everybody knows this. He did not say this on his own, but because he was high priest that year, he prophesied. God is faithful to the authority that he establishes right up until the end there before in in answer to the prophecy of our Lord himself from Mark chapter 12 and Luke chapter 20 when he would take that authority from them and give that authority to the New Testament church. Well, let's that's a good segue. Let's come up to the New Testament now and let's see if we can't see scripture tradition and magisterium in the New Testament. Well, I, I think my opponent has has uh, beaten 2 Timothy 3.16 in the ground, and I'm sure we're going to hear it again. And, and I'm, I'm so glad he acknowledged that we Catholics agree. All Scripture is the open of stuff. It is God-breathed, and it's useful for teaching. In fact, it is sufficient, I say, as a Catholic. That's right, James. It is sufficient to equip us for every good work. We Catholics believe that. I know that might come as as a shock, but we are permitted to believe that as Catholics. And I hold to that, as do the majority of the fathers, I believe, that it is useful for teaching. And in fact, it is sufficient to equip us. However, folks, my opponent, not only does he make this mistake with the fathers, that is, he'll take fathers out of context, as he just did with St. Athanasius. And he's done numerous times uh, in in his, his books. But he will do the same thing when it comes to Scripture. And remember this, students. Remember what I said, and I always say in my classes. He has fallen to the same error of our friends the Jehovah's Witnesses, who they will grab hold of one verse. How many of you have ever talked to Jehovah's Witnesses? And I mean really dialogue with a knowledgeable one. You know that they will take you for a spin if they're knowledgeable through Scripture. They will. And they will hold on to verses like John 20:10, 1 Timothy 2, 5. There's one God, one meteor between God and man. The man, Jesus Christ. See, he's a man. How much more do you need? The scripture says he's a man. And they'll pound it in your head. And you know what we respond? We respond as Catholics. We say, absolutely. I agree with you. Just go ahead and let him say it. He's a man. 
And then we say, yes, we agree. He is 100% man. He's not 50% man. He's not 80% man. He is 100% man. But guess what, folks? There are other scriptures that teach clearly he is also 100% God, John 1, 1 and such. Now, we agree on that point. But I'm going to suggest to you that just as my opponent has taken the father of the church out of context, he has done the same thing with sacred scripture. Yes, scripture is inspired. It's the word of God. But so, my friends, is the spoken word of God. And that is what oral tradition is. Luke ten sixteen. Whoever hears you, hears me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. And I, I, I just, I loved it when he, when he quoted uh, 2 Thessalonians two fifteen. But I would like to refer first to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Why? Because this is very significant, folks. This is the first epistle St. Paul ever wrote. And yet, notice what he says. For this reason, we too give thanks to God unceasingly, that in receiving the word of God from hearing us, he hadn't written anything to him yet. You receive not a human word, but as it truly is the word of God. Then in 2 Thessalonians 2, 2.15, he says, Therefore, brothers, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions you were taught, notice, either by oral statement or by letter of ours. Now, Mr. White, I don't think the Scriptures can get any more plain than that. The Word of God comes to us by Scripture, that is, the written Word, and by oral tradition. Now, I asked Mr. White to show me where the Scripture says that that commandment no longer ab- applies to us. Where does the Scripture say, oh, that only applied to them. Once everything got written down, well, then, now we go by that, see? The Bible never says that. It never, never, anywhere. So Mr. White's going to have to show me, educate me, teach me where, in fact, the Scripture does say. And we could go through a litany uh, of Scriptures, more Scriptures, that demonstrate the tradition, the spoken Word of God is equally as authoritative as the written Word. But now I must move forward to the magisterium. Do we see a magisterium of the church in the New Testament? Let me quote Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 18. And I want you to notice there is a parallel to Deuteronomy chapter 17 that I quoted to you earlier. If your brother shall offend against thee, go rebuke him between thee and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. If he will not hear you, take with you one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may stand. If he will not hear them, tell the church. And if he will not hear the church, let him be to thee as a heathen and a publican. That is, excommunicated, cut off from the believers. Amen, I say to you, whatsoever you shall bind upon earth shall be bound also in heaven. And whatever you loose upon earth shall be loosed in heaven. I want you to notice, folks, what it did not say. If you have a problem between brother and brother. Now, my opponent will no doubt stand up and say, oh, well, that's only talking about uh, minor disagreements. I had one in, in one debate, honest, honest, honest engine. I had in one debate, a fellow told me that, well, you know, that's talking about things like getting your car. Well, I invite you to look at the context of Matthew chapter 18, where, where Jesus says, if you offend one of these little ones, it's better for you to tie a stone around, a millstone around your neck and be cast into the sea than to lead one of these little ones astray. That's the context of Matthew 18. Folks, there is no better, there is no worse fault that we can have between one another than heresy. False doctrine that can destroy souls. As St. Paul described it, false doctrine eats like a canker worm. And that doesn't mean the body, that's talking about our souls. There is no greater problem that we can have. And according to the New Testament, folks, the, the scriptures that my, my opponent so venerates, and I appreciate that, We take it to the church. And the church, yes, the church has the final say. Does that mean the church is Lord over the scriptures? No. It means the Lord, the the Lord has given to his church this great gift to his bride authority over the children. Can you imagine a family? We have Jesus as the husband, the church as, as wife. But can you imagine if, if the wife had no authority over the children? She couldn't say anything to the kids. They just run roughshod over her. That's absurd. Of course not. Jesus gives us an an authoritative church, not the Lord over the Word of God, but the church hears the word of her husband and recognizes it and teaches the children. Yes, 1 Timothy 3.15 says the church 
not the Bible, is the ground and pillar and foundation of truth. I couldn't believe when my opponent quoted, as he did on the radio the other day, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, when he said, he, he just quoted me and said, we don't just have a book, but we have a living church. And then he quotes Hebrews 4.12 that says, the book's alive. Or at least that's how he said it on the radio. The book's alive. Well, guess what, folks? Check, listen to that Bible you got in your hands and see if there's a heartbeat. And then I want you to look at Hebrews 4.12 and look at the context. The context says, look at verse 13. Him, him, him. It's referring, the word of God, you see, this is a common error that my Protestant friends make. Common error. And that is equating the scriptures with the word of God whenever you see word of God in scripture. Hebrews 4.12 is not talking about scripture. It's talking about a person, Jesus Christ. The word of God comes to us first as a person. Second, orally preached, according to 1 Peter chapter 2. Then it is written. And finally, my time is running out. I want to demonstrate to you that this magisterium of the church did not die in the first century. Jesus did not give authority to the apostles and then have that authority die with them. And somehow, and Mr. White is going to have to show me the verses, somewhere there's this, trans, there's this change where we don't go by the tradition, the spoken word of God, and the written word of God anymore, but, and, and we don't obey our bishops, but we just go by the scripture alone. I, I'm not sure. You'll have to show me where that is in sacred scripture. But... Let me show you what the truth is, folks, as the Catholic Church presents it. The, the, the teaching of, of sacred scripture is that in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, and I want you to notice the context of Ephesians 3. In Ephesians 3, 10, St. Paul says, so that the manifold wisdom of God may, might now be made known through the Bible to the principal... Is that what that says? No. Through the church to the principalities and authorities in the heavens. Notice... It was, and by the way, Jan, I picked this one out for James. It was predestined before the foundation of the world that this would be the means whereby God would reveal his manifest wisdom to the angels, the powers and principalities. Remember, I was in a debate not long ago with a fundamentalist who said, well, that verse only says that the church teaches angels. Well, that's true. I guess you got me there. But if you read a little bit further, you're going to see the context. Yes, the church in a sense, and St. Thomas Aquinas gets into that great mystery of how she does teach uh, angels, but we, well, that's another issue, isn't it? But if you continue reading, you'll see that the church does not only teach angels, but in Ephesians chapter 4, the scripture says, God has set apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, and teachers in the church. Why? For the work of the ministry, the building up of the saints, right? So that we henceforth be not children... Notice, children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. We have a mother in the church that we can trust, and she is divine as well as human. Now, I want you to notice, so that we henceforth be not tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. I would suggest to you folks that Protestantism, and I'll get, uh, I'm running out of time, I'll get to this in my next statement and rebuttal. Protestantism is proof positive. That sola scriptura is an utter failure. Not only is it not historical, it's not biblical. But folks, the fact that there are 23,000 denominations within 500 years ought to say, hey, there's something going on here. 23,000, that's 40 new churches. In fact, my mother just sent me 40 new churches a year for 500 years. Which one is the true church? My, my mother just sent me a, a, a newspaper clipping from Virginia where we have a new Baptist church. That's one of the, his... I don't know how they relate. Well, it's a Baptist church. They just split and started a new church. Maybe that's the new. Maybe that's the true church. It's been around there for two weeks. But now, I want to demonstrate to you, folks, that this authority in the church does not cease in the first century. And this is very important. In Hebrews thirteen seven, get your Bibles out and read it. Saint Paul or whomever wrote Hebrews, we do not know, said, "Remember your prelates." who have spoken the word of God to you, follow their faith, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible says to follow your prayers. Who are these guys? Are they the apostles? They are the ones ordained 
by the apostles. In Acts chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, the Bible makes it very clear what we are to do in a case when we have a disagreement over Scripture or whatever it may be concerning the faith. In Acts 15, the apostles took it to the church, and the church had the final say. Thank you. We have two 15-minute rebuttals and then two 10-minute rebuttals. I must begin by apologizing. It is my desire that in these dialogues both sides be accurately represented. Misrepresentations do nothing to accomplish anything. In the past 25 minutes, the Protestant position has been misrepresented so many times I lost count. Most fundamentally, over and over and over again, in fact, if this misrepresentation was left out, there wouldn't have been much left. Over and over and over again, it, the church has authority. Yeah, it does. Didn't you hear what I said about First Timothy 3? The church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. There is a difference between having authority to teach God's truth and being infallible. A vast difference. The fallacy being presented is, well, either you have an infallible church or you have you and your Bible in the woods. The idea that the church, as the bride of Christ and dwelt by the Spirit of God, learning from the Scriptures and teaching those to people so that they are sanctified in their journey in Jesus Christ, that middle ground is seemingly lost someplace. And I'm sorry, because that definitely limits the value of this dialogue. I tried. I try when I cite from documents and when I cite from writers to be fair to those writers and those documents. Mr. Staples accuses me of misrepresenting Athanasius. Mr. Staples has a list of quotations on his desk. I have Athanasius. And when Athanasius talks about these issues, I would invite you, please, there's a book out on the table called Sola Scriptura. I have a chapter in there on Sola Scriptura in the early church. There are other authors like R.C. Sproul and John MacArthur and, and people like that who have contributed to the book. Look up the references. Find them for yourself. Don't read them in quote books like Jurgens. Read them in their actual context and see for yourself. But also realize that Athanasius said these words. Vainly then... Do they run about with the pretext that they have demanded counsels for the faith's sake? For divine scripture is sufficient above all things. But if a counsel be needed on the point, there are the proceedings of the fathers. For the Nicene bishops did not neglect this matter, but stated the doctrine so exactly that persons reading their words honestly cannot but be reminded by them of the religion towards Christ announced where? In the divine scriptures. You will find consistently in this book that Athanasius defends the deity of Christ and the Nicene Council, not on the basis that the Nicene Council has some authority in and of itself that is separate from what God has revealed in scripture, but the Nicene Council has authority because what it says is in line with the divine scriptures. It is easy to accuse people of misrepresenting people. It's very easy. My opponent has talked about the papacy in the past, and I've tried to correspond with him about misrepresentations there. That doesn't do you any good, and I'm not going to get into it. Look him up yourself. Please, take the time to do so. Mark chapter 7, please turn there if you have the opportunity. Mark chapter 7, verses 8 through 13. We have the same situation we encounter in Matthew chapter 15. For the Lord Jesus teaches us that there is one ultimate authority, and that ultimate authority is Scripture. There we have a situation where Jesus encounters the scribes and Pharisees, which we've just been told, I guess, in Caiaphas, were an infallible authority. I didn't know they were infallible. 
Authority? Yes. Infallible? Completely different issue. Caiaphas and John 11? Authority. High priest? Yes. Infallible? Obviously not. He was an heir on many things. Here's one of them. He believed in the Corban rule. Matthew 15, 1 through 9, Mark chapter 7, verses 8 through 13. Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. But wait a minute. The Jews didn't think this was a tradition of men. Look at Tractate Aboth in the Talmud. They claim the exact same type of oral tradition passed down through their hierarchy that Rome claims today. And this had that pedigree. And what does Jesus do? Oh, well, they must accept it then. No. He says in verse 12, and it says in verse 13, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition, specifically differentiating between the word of God and that term tradition that they were using, which you handed down and you do many things such as that. What do you do when you encounter a tradition that is claimed to be divine in origin? If you follow Jesus, you test it by Scripture. Now, Mr. Staples says we have this infallible rule of faith. I'd like to ask him to show us. The Roman Catholic Church has defined certain doctrines on the basis of tradition. One of them that's fairly recent is the bodily assumption of the Virgin Mary. I would like to ask Mr. Staples, in light of his comments on 2 Thessalonians 2.15, which I do not believe even began to deal with the context and the language that Paul used, but if he wants to say that this is a command to hold these traditions, it's not, but let's say he does. Let's, let's go with that interpretation. The command is in the past tense, Mr. Staples, in the sense that these things were already taught to the Thessalonians. That must mean the Thessalonians believed in this, if you're saying that this tradition was from the apostles. Therefore, since everyone in the church in Thessalonica, not just the bishop, but everyone in the church of Thessalonica learned these things, and that these things do not exist in Scripture. All right. Trace it for us. Trace it through history. Tell us about this doctrine. Tell us when you first find it. Can we find it in Ignatius? Clement of Rome? Irenaeus? Tertullian? Athanasius? Augustine? Dr. Ludwig Ott, Fundamentals of the Catholic Faith, admits the first time it's found is in the transitist literature of the 5th century, literature that was anathematized by Pope Galatius in 495. If it's apostolic, if that's where it came from, then trace it for us. Show us this infallible rule of faith in light of 2 Thessalonians 2.15. When Mr. Staples had a gentleman by the name of Clayton Bauer Jr. on his program a while back, he said with Tim's full approval that the Roman Catholic Church this is Mr. Bauer speaking, is not a Bible-based church, but that the Bible is a church-based book. I'd like to ask Mr. Staples if he agrees with that. If he doesn't, he can dismiss the rest of this. But I'd like to point out to you that quite on the contrary, the Scriptures pre-existed the church and were the very seedbed in which she grew. Because of this, you'll find many an early father who will castigate those who try to separate the Bible from the church but they will at the same time deny the very fundamental assertion of my opponent this evening. When Cyprian wrote to Pompey, he said the following, quote, Whence is this doctrine? Does it come from the authority of the Lord and of the gospel, or does it come from the commands and epistles of the apostles? For that those things must be done which are written, written, God testifies and commands when he says to Joshua, The book of this law shall not depart out of your mouth, that you may observe to do all things which are written. If, therefore, it is either commanded in the gospel or contained in the epistles and the acts, then also this sacred doctrine must be observed. More than a century later, when Augustine dealt with this passage, he did not find fault at all with what Cyprian had said. Instead, he himself asserted that the church must be proved from the Bible. Listen to just some of his comments. He said, let us not hear this I say or this you say, but thus says the Lord. Surely it is the books of the Lord on whose authority we both agree and which we both believe. There let us seek the church. There let us discuss our case. 
He also said, let those things be removed from our midst which we quote against each other, not from divine canonical books, but from elsewhere. Someone may perhaps ask, why do you want to remove these things from the midst? Because I do not want the Holy Church proved by human documents, but by divine oracles. And he also said, whatever they may adduce and wherever they may quote from, let us rather, if we are his sheep, hear the voice of our shepherd. Therefore, let us search for the church in the sacred canonical scriptures. Now, I hope that you will not ignore those references and because someone says, oh, they're out of context. Really? Show me the context. Show me the context demonstrates these things aren't true. Oh, well, over here, this father said, okay, that's fine. Let's go over there and look what that father said over there. But let's not ignore what he said here. I can give you example after example. Basil of Caesarea, for example, when dealing with people who had a different view of the Godhead, said they have their customs, we have our customs. Let's go to the God-breathed scripture and the side on which the God-breathed scriptures cast its vote of truth. That's the side we're going to believe. But then later on, when he was talking about other traditions, such as which direction to face when praying and uh, how many times to baptize someone in baptism and so on and so forth, he said, well, we have these traditions. You mean Basil was inconsistent with himself? Yes, he was. We do need to look at the context. Not just a, a list of quotes. I once had an opponent say, I can bury Mr. White under 56 pages of quotes. My friends, please, don't let that kind of braggadocious attitude keep you from writing these references down and digging deep and taking time. Matthew chapter 23 was presented to us by Mr. Staples. He says, here Jesus accepts tradition, the seed of Moses. He accepts tradition as an infallible authority here because he doesn't reject the current form of worship in the synagogue service? Where's something about infallible authority here? I don't see anything about infallible authority. This overthrows what he does in Matthew 15 or in Mark 7? Certainly not. This isn't an acceptance of some infallible authority. It's a recognition that there are authorities that exist outside of Scripture, but they're not infallible. They may be good. They may be right. Mr. Staples over and over again ignored what I said in my presentation. I pointed out the sola scriptura speaks to the normative condition of the church. Well, the word of God was oral at one point. Yeah. So? The point is, in what form is it now? You see, Rome tells us that the word of God orally was things like papal infallibility and the immaculate conception and bodily assumption. The apostles never thought that. The other church didn't believe that. So why should I believe this claim? Why does Mr. Staples believe today in the bodily assumption of Mary? I submit to you it is because of sola ecclesia. Tradition doesn't teach it. If he can't trace it back to the beginning, he's got to admit tradition doesn't teach it. The scriptures don't teach it. So why does he believe it? Sola ecclesia, just as I said. I'm not trying to misrepresent anything. I'm trying to focus upon the simple fact that we have a battle here between two ultimate authorities. And Mr. S Mr. Staples said, that, well, the Scripture is sufficient to equip us for every good work. All right? If Mr. Staples believes that it is true, that the Immaculate Conception, for example, is true, the bodily assumption is true, then show us how the Scriptures equip him to teach that doctrine. It certainly must be a good work to teach it, right, if it's true. And show us how the scriptures equip him to teach that doctrine. If he can't do that, then obviously he's not actually saying the scriptures are sufficient. He's saying this broader context, this sacred tradition with a capital S and a capital T that includes this other extra biblical revelation is somehow what is sufficient. Get the tapes. Look up the references. Write down notes from what we've said. Listen to what I said about what Sola Scriptura is. And then check out the objections that have been made to it by Mr. Staples. For example, over and over again, the citation of 1 Thessalonians 2.13, for example, is based upon the assertion that I deny the church has any authority. I ask you, listen to anything I said in my opening statement. Read the Roman Catholic controversy. Read Sola Scriptura and find one place where I said the church has no authority. 
Just one. It's not there. The difference is not between having authority and not having authority. It's between being infallible and God-breathed and having authority because you possess the God-breathed revelation and can teach from it. That is the issue. Now it's evident that we have somewhat of a partisan crowd this evening, and that's great. I'm glad. But I'm not going to stand up here and say, now you, my students, I have students. I teach at three different schools. You're not my students. You're people I care for enough to come out here and challenge you to think, to lay aside your prejudices, to lay aside your partisan spirit, in a sense, and consider these things. You're my judges, not my students. Because you have to judge what is being said here this evening. Thank you. <clears throat> First of all, I, uh, I do realize that it does seem to be a partisan crowd. But I, 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 I hope I'm not sounding. Uh, let me just say this, folks. I am passionate about the Catholic truth because for many, many years I was raised a Baptist. I was an Assembly of God pastor. I lived Protestantism, and I know Mr. White will tell me I don't know a thing about Protestantism. But I have read and I have studied and I tried to remain pro- Protestant, folks. Believe me, those of you who, who know me. If anybody is here who knew me before I was Catholic, I was a far cry from a candidate. Anybody would think. In fact, the the fellow that converted me said, man, when you left, I was so glad you were gone. And I thought, forget that guy. He'll never be Catholic. So I'm not up here, uh, you know, just trying to pilot points and win a debate. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here to present the truth of the Catholic faith. But in the process of doing that, understand, I need to expose the errors of my opponent. And that's all that I'm doing. I like this guy. In fact, anybody that wears a rush tie, you've got to like. But now to the point. Enough of the nicer. <laughs> My opponent uh, just quoted to you St. Basil of Caesarea, and I have the quote from his book. I believe it's on page 155, where he uses St. Basil. He's going to check that. St. Basil of Caesarea to supposedly show that Basil taught soul scripture. And I want you to remember, folks, what he said. He said, yes, there, Basil teaches the scripture is the soul rule of faith. And then he said in other places, well, if he's talking about, well, which way you're going to face when you're praying, then he will talk about tradition. Well, is that the case? I'm going to quote to you from St. Basil of Caesarea on the spirit. And it's true that in this work, there are lots of things discussed. But I want you to see the context of what he's saying. He says, listen, of the dogmas and kerygmas preserved in the church. Some we possess from written teaching and others we receive from the tradition of the apostles handed on to us in mystery. In respect to piety, both are of the same force. It is more, Mr. White, than just which way you're facing when you pray. It is the dogmas and kerygmas of the Catholic faith. And I could go through and quote St. John Chrysostom and St. Augustine. In fact, I think we'll have to get to him later. Because, friends, I encourage you to read St. Augustine. He is a Catholic bishop, Catholic to the core. But I need to get now to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. I want to come back to the point that my opponent made in his opening statement, that 2 Timothy 3, 16 demonstrates, proves to us, that the Scripture is the sole rule of faith. In order to do this, I'm going to quote 2 Timothy in context. Beginning at verse 14. In fact, we could go back further, but let's start at verse 14. But continue in those things which thou hast learned and which have been committed to thee, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And because from thy tiny infancy thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which can instruct thee to salvation by the faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God 
and is profitable to teach, reprove, correct, and instruct in righteousness. Now, I want you to notice, and I refer to Cardinal Newman, who once said of this passage, and Cardinal Newman, you may know, was a convert from Anglicanism who wrote the great work on the development of Christian doctrine, which, by the way, he wrote when he wasn't even Catholic. He had things he wrote in there even against the papacy, but he later came to see through his understanding of the development of doctrine, that the Catholic Church is the true church, and he indeed became Catholic. But at any rate, Cardinal Newman once wrote that, if this verse that my opponent quoted to prove Sola Scriptura, proves Sola Scriptura, it proves too much. Why? Because the context of the passage, if we're going to tr- interpret this in an exclusive way like my opponent is, and remember, I, I'm the one who told you, I warned you, and I'm sorry if I refer to my students, James, I love my students and my kids from my youth ministry that are here. Forgive me. But I was the one who warned you, do not quote one scripture like the Jehovah's Witness. And we're hanging on, man, we're hanging on to this verse that says Jesus is man. And boy, show us anything else. And it doesn't matter because we've got this one verse. See, there are many other verses. And you see, and I demonstrated that. And now let me demonstrate to you the context of 2 Timothy 3 to show that even in context, my opponent's got it all wrong. Why? Because what St. Paul is speaking about, again, if we're going to hold to this exclusive interpretation of Scripture, is the Old Testament. Nowhere does Paul, obviously, he's not referring to the passage he's now sitting down with his stylus and writing. And he's not referring to 2 Peter, perhaps Hebrews. Certainly the book of Revelation that had not even been written yet, folks. So the context is he is speaking about the Old Testament. Yes, it is true that the New Testament is also inspired. But folks, I can't let Mr. White make that jump. Because in order to even say what the New Testament is, he has to refer to Catholic tradition, the tradition of the church, because the Bible itself doesn't tell us what, in fact, the New Testament even is. Second point, the word that is translated in the King James as perfect, the Greek word is artios, and the verb that is used subsequently, ex artizo, does not mean Sufficient in the sense that James White wants to make it mean. That is, that is sufficient in the sense that we don't need anything else whatsoever. I urge you to hear my words. This is the same error of the Jehovah's Witness, the Arians, who hold to one verse and exclude the others. Yes, the scripture is inspired and as such it is able to equip us. But folks, think about it. How can it tell us what it is? You see, the scripture itself tells us to go to the tradition of the church and to the church itself as an authority. Why? Because obviously, and I'll use the most obvious case. There are so many cases that we could use. But I'll use the most obvious case, the canon of sacred scripture. In the early church, folks, and I have a number of quotes, I recommend you read uh, the Catholic commentary on scripture, the New Jerome Biblical Commentary and the, and the article in Canonicity. And the, this is a matter of historical record, folks. This isn't something that, that we can dispute. The bishops in the church, in the early church, disagreed over what, in fact, the New Testament was to contain. Let me quote to you Origen's commentary on the Psalms. And he says, I quote, Peter, upon whom is built the church of Christ. I want you to notice. One thing he's certain about is who the church is built upon. Against whom the gates of hell shall not prevail. Against let only uh, He left us only one epistle of acknowledged genuinity. Let us concede a second, which, however, is doubtful. One thing he was certain about is that Jesus built his church upon Peter. But notice, he's not so sure about Second Peter. And friends, in the early church, there was huge disagreement. Yes, I said huge. And I have a list here. And if need be, I will call upon it to demonstrate that fact. But the point is. Where do you go? And if Mr. White is going to teach, and if you are going to say that the Scripture is the sole rule of faith, folks, one of the most important doctrines in the early church, one of the most important things you better get right is what the Bible is, don't you think? And yet, so, Mr. White, I ask you to demonstrate to me from the Scriptures, you believe in sola scriptura, you've said so, 
you need to demonstrate how the Bible teaches us which books of the Bible are, in fact, the Bible. And I also I want you to notice he never did respond to what I asked him to do, to demonstrate to me scripture that said that gives us the time when the commandment from Second Thessalonians 2.15 stopped. And then we start only believing in what's written. And you need to give me scripture, Mr. White, to show me where that commandment is. Secondly, I would like to mention again, to get back to, to Arteos and Exartizo, to say that this means sufficient and we do not need anything else. Now, again, Mr. White said, well, I'm not saying we don't need anything else. We do need the church. I believe he would agree with that. We do need the church. It's just that the church has an ultimate authority in the scripture. But I want to demonstrate to you folks that the scripture itself, and yes, I did make the statement or, or my, my companion on the radio broadcast did say that the church um, is not a Bible based church. The Bible is or the Bible is a church based book. I got it right. The fact is the church did not pre exist the Bible. Or I'm sorry, the church did in fact pre exist the Bible. The Bible was not existence, that is the New Testament. When Paul first started preaching the Word of God and Peter and so forth, it would come along later. And in fact the arguments would go on for centuries over which books of the Bible were in fact the Bible. And when, in fact, the church called councils in order to come to the bottom line on what Scripture was, notice what they did not do. They did not go to the Scriptures and say, see, the Scripture proves that Hebrews is the Word of God. The Scripture proves that Shepherd of Hermas or the Epistle of Clement is not the Word of God. Show me, Mr. White, and you've got, you said it, a partisan crowd here, well, you could convert a lot of Catholics. If you could show where the Bible demonstrates to us that it is sufficient by demonstrating to us that it shows us what the canon of Scripture is. The fact is it cannot. And I could give you a litany of other traditions which Mr. White holds that also cannot be proven from Scripture alone. Why? Why is there a problem there, folks? The problem is that Scripture alone is not sufficient as a rule of faith. That is why God has given us the tradition and the church to interpret that tradition. Finally, again, to finally get to my point on that Greek verb exartiza, I believe if you use the principle of hermeneutics that my opponent is using with exartiza, you reach uh, devastating conclusions when you consider verses like James chapter 1, verse 4. Now, I know, Mr. White, this is a different Greek word. My Greek professor, if he were here, would be happy to hear me say that. But I do realize that these are two different Greek words. But what I'm doing is I'm using an analogy here to show that that verse, 2 Timothy 3.16, does not teach sufficiency in a formal sense. In fact, I would suggest to you folks, can you imagine what would happen if I attempted to prove a, a Catholic doctrine using one verse of Scripture, one verb, in fact, and a subordinate clause of one Scripture, and say, there it is, man, that's the Word of God. Can you imagine what Mr. White would say to me? Can you imagine? In James chapter 1, verse 4, the Scripture says, And let patience have its perfect work, that you may, perfect, you may be perfect and entire and lacking in nothing. Folks, it doesn't get much more plain than that. If we, we're going to use his hermeneutic principle here, then John Lennon was wrong. All we need is patience. We don't need anything else. We certainly we don't need the Scripture. We don't need Jesus. We don't need the Bible. All we need is patience. Of course, that's absurd. But that verse is not teaching sufficiency, nor is 2 Timothy 3.16, at least in the formal sense that he wants to make it out to be. Now, secondly, I want to point out how that Scripture is unworkable in demonstrating that the history of Protestantism, and I'm going to issue another challenge to Mr. White. The first challenge is to demonstrate that the canon of Scripture is proved in Scripture itself. Secondly, I have another challenge. Mr. White has discussed how the traditions that Paul talks about is nothing other than the gospel which is contained in the written Scriptures. 
Well, by the way, that's another Protestant tradition not found in Scripture. Where does St. Paul say, where does the Scripture say that what he talks about is nothing other than what's written in Scripture? He says exactly the opposite in, in 2 Thessalonians 2. But be that as it may, Mr. White, I think you, you're, you're missing something very important here. You presume that when you say, Paul is talking about the gospel, that everybody knows what the gospel is, folks. You and I, James, uh, Mr. White, radically disagree on what the gospel is. And in fact, I can point out to you how that Protestant theologians and denominations, in fact, disagree over what the gospel is. Where do you go? Not only do we have his, the historical rea reality that Christians disagreed over what scripture is, now we have churches, 26,000 of them, in fact. I've read as many, 23 to 26, give or take a thousand or two. And let me ask you, what is the gospel? What is the essential? What are the essential truths that I must believe in order to be a Christian? Is it the 39 articles of the Anglican Church? Is it the 12 fundamentals of the fundamentalist church of the last century? Is it today among the evangelicals? And God knows what is essential in evangelical Christianity. I don't know what this man believes. I do not know what he considers is essential for Christianity. Thank you. Now, 10-minute rebuttal. I'd immediately like to ask the moderator to request that my opponent no longer sing. <laughs> Anyone agree with me on that? Not only that, I have no idea what song he's talking about either. <clears throat> I'm glad that my opponent has listened to my debate with Patrick Madrid on Sola Scriptura, because that's the debate he's responding to, obviously. At least I hope that's the one, because you know why? I'm, I'd be really disappointed if, in fact, he had the time to read my book. Because almost everything that Mr. Staples has said about my brief comments on 2 Timothy 3:16 through 17 are addressed in my book. And unfortunately, he gave you the indication that um, I've never dealt with these things. In fact, he keeps accusing me of being a Jehovah's Witness and using this one verse. Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses in Phoenix know me real well, and they would really be surprised that I was a Jehovah's Witness. I've got a book coming out next spring on the Trinity. I, I, that really makes me a lousy Jehovah's Witness. But the problem is, if, if, if Mr. Staples read my book, he would know that I dealt with 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 in context over the space of more than four pages with 11 endnotes, and that was the brief discussion. And I invited Mr. Staples to contact me and ask for any other information he could possibly want. Anything I've written, he'll tell you. I sent, I sent him my books, tapes, but no charge. Just so that this wouldn't happen. Just so that this wouldn't happen. I'm not just citing one verse. The view of Scripture enunciated by Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3 is the view of every prophet and apostle in Scripture. And it's especially the view of the Lord Jesus Christ as he views the Bible as God's very speaking to men. I dealt with Cardinal Newman. Cardinal Newman misunderstood the application of the passage. We're not talking about the canon of Scripture there. We're not talking. I recognized. I even, everything Mr. Stable said, this is the Old Testament. I said that. Yes, it is. No two ways about it. That is not the issue. And again, I apologize because we've done, we've spent a lot of time on issues that didn't need to be spent on because that's not my position. I've dealt with those things. And I'm sorry about that. But, Mr. Staples has made a couple statements, and then I want to spend most of my time dealing with the canon argument. He says, the church did pre-exist the Bible, as in the New Testament, and that's the error. You see, God's people have always had God's revelation to rely upon, even in the Old Testament time. 
Remember what happened when the book of the law would be discovered? It would be read before the king and he'd tear his clothes and, oh my goodness, what have we done? They had the scriptures. Sometimes we see some terrible things that happen when the scriptures become almost unknown. God's people wander around in darkness. But the church of Jesus Christ, take a, take a translation. The United Bible Society's text does this in the Greek. It will put every citation of the Old Testament in italics. Take a look at the New Testament and tell me the New Testament writers didn't have the Scriptures. They did. And for the church, the citation of the Scriptures, that was it. That was it. Final authority. As the Scriptures say it, that's it. And we as the church have the authority to teach those Scriptures. But the church is subservient to those Scriptures. He also said, Mr. White didn't respond to my thing about 2 Thessalonians 2.15. Yes, I did. Maybe, maybe he was writing something at that time, but I specifically pointed out that it's a misinterpretation of the passage. It's not a command, and it is simply an error to say, well, what you've got here is you've got a command to hold on to extra scriptural revelation. When did that stop? Mr. Staples, Paul was not calling these people to hold to extra scriptural revelation. What Paul taught them in person and what he wrote to them were one the same things. He didn't contradict himself. He wrote with one message, and it was the gospel. Mr. Stable says, well, you all disagree on the gospel. I've talked to so many Roman Catholics who disagree on the gospel. I guess that makes the teaching of the church unclear, too. No, of course not. But I can tell you one thing about the gospel. Whatever you might say about people being confused about the gospel, Mr. Staples, there's one thing that no person who simply reads the New Testament is going to be confused about. And that is, no person's ever going to be confused about the idea that the gospel includes such things as indulgences. Never be confused by that. And I feel for anyone who would think that it does, because the clear message in the New Testament of the gospel is the sufficiency of the work of one person. Not satis passio in purgatory, but the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now, the issue, four minutes. The canon. Seems like this is a trump card again. Unfortunately, everything I said about this subject in the book was, I guess, not looked at, not dealt with, not responded to. I differentiated in my book. This is in the Roman Catholic controversy. And by the way, you were wrong about the page that Basil was cited on. It's page 35 of the book on Sola Scriptura. And in fact, I cited everything that he read plus more, more context than what he read. And yet he says, I'm taking it out of context. I invite you to just look. This book. But I dealt with the issue of the canon extensively. I pointed out that the canon is determined and decided by one person, God. Why? Because the canon is simply the list of what God inspired and what he doesn't. God ultimately, and Roman Catholic theologians agree with this, God ultimately is the author of canon. The canon does not exist separately from Scripture. It is a function of the work of inspiration of the Scripture. The issue we have to deal with here is, how do we know, how do we gain knowledge of what the canon is? And Mr. Staples may stand up here and say, I have infallible knowledge of what the canon is. Well, when did you get that infallible knowledge? Mr. Staples, the New Catholic Encyclopedia, admits that the first dogmatic and infallible definition of what the canon is in its fullness took place about 450 years ago. What did anybody do before then? 1540, 1500 years, no one could live a proper Christian life because they didn't have an infallible revelation of the canon? Of course not. Pope Gregory the Great didn't even agree with the canon the Council of Trent came up with. Cardinal Cayetan, Thomas of Dio at the time of Reformation, laughed at those who believed that the Deuterocanonical books were canonical. So what do we have here? Well, Mr. Staples has just proven my original assertion right again. Why does Mr. Staples have infallible certainty about the canon? It's not because he's read Athanasius or Jerome or gone into tradition or gone into scripture. Sola Ecclesia. There it is again, ultimate authority. I have infallible certainty. How, how did Mr. Staples, and you know I'm going to ask you this question because you've listened to the debate. How did the godly man who lived in Palestine 50 years before Christ know that Isaiah or Second Chronicles was Scripture? You know that's the question that I ask. I'd like to see what you say. 
Did he have an infallible revelation? I can't believe you're going to say that because the canon they held to there in Palestine was different than yours, so it couldn't have been infallible. Well, did he not have an infallible revelation? Then how could Jesus hold men responsible for what Scripture says? He did, Matthew chapter 22. Well, wait a minute. If Jesus can hold men accountable for what Scripture says without some infallible magisterium to tell them what Scripture is, then why can't I as a Protestant have a sufficient knowledge of the canon without an infallible magisterium? Why can't I do that? I can The fact of the matter is, when Mr. Staples talks to us about this infallible tradition, it's not infallible. That tradition to which he holds has made many an error. It's contradicted itself and has now defined as dogmatic beliefs binding upon the Christian conscience doctrines utterly unknown in the Bible and unknown in the early church. And I could stand up here and say, talk about all the challenges that I've made to Mr. Staples that I haven't heard a word of response on like he talked about my not responding. We don't have time to get to everything up here. There's going to be some things he's going to say I'm not going to be able to get to. There's going to be some things vice versa. That's the way of debate. But on this issue, I think Mr. Staples needs to step up to the bat. Does Mr. Staples believe in the bodily assumption of Mary? That's my first question. Does he believe it's an apostolic doctrine? Secondly, and would he please trace it for us and demonstrate that his understanding of 2 Thessalonians 2.15 is in fact correct? I think that's a fair request. Thank you very much. First of all, my opponent asked me the question, how did the man of God know what Scripture was 50 years before Christ? He knew it by adhering to the tradition of the church. As I demonstrated to you, the tradition of... Now, when I say church, I'm speaking of the Old Testament in the sense that the book of Acts does. It's the church or the ecclesia, the called out ones in the wilderness. But the fact is... The Old Testament church, so to speak, did not, it is true, did not have a council or, a, or an infallible statement from the high priest. They did not have a council where they concluded what the, the canon was. And I find that fascinating. In that, yes, even though they didn't. In fact, I have here a list of a number of different canons that the Jews relied on. The, if you're Alexandrian or Ethiopian Jew, you had... The Septuagint, or some, what we would call today the Septuagint, which contained both the proto- and deuterocanonical books. If you were an Essene, you had the, the Pentateuch, you had uh, much of what we have minus the Book of Esther, and you had some of the deuterocanonicals. If you were a Pharisee, you had uh, the Palestinian canon. If you were a Hellenistic Jew of the dispersion, you had the Septuagint. If you were a Sadducee, you accepted the Pentateuch only. So, yes, they were divided on this issue at the time of Christ. That's a fact. But you see, that does not change the fact that the Old Testament man of God is still bound to the authority that God established in the Old Testament. You see, my opponent cannot answer the question, so he is uh, making a, a clever debate trick here and trying to shift the burden of proof onto me. But, of course, that's not what this debate is about. He is supposed to demonstrate to me that the Scripture alone is a sole rule of faith. And when I ask him to give me Scripture, he's the one who believes it, not me. Sola Scriptura. The Scripture alone is the sole rule of the faith. Well, if that's true, then we ought to see why we accept the canon of Scripture in the Scripture. In fact, whenever Mr. White goes, I want you to notice, whenever Mr. White goes to prove why he accepts this or that canon, what does he do? He goes to the tradition of the church. He just doesn't want to admit that, you know, he's more Catholic than he knows. Second point is, I did not call Mr. White a Jehovah's Witness. (laughs) But I think he, he, he did fail to see the point that I was making in demonstrating, you know, and I, I know we toss around these numbers a lot in debates, but it is true, the 23,000 churches, the 26,000 churches. But I believe my question is a valid one. He's already demonstrated that he can't give me an infallible reason. He can't give me an authoritative reason 
why he can accept Scripture as the inspired, infallible rule of faith. Listen, folks, if you don't have an infallible source to understand what the Scripture is, then how can you say, as St. Thomas Aquinas once wrote, that you even have the habit of faith? Because faith must be rooted in an infallible source. Now, Mr. White, I accept your challenge to debate infallibility. I accept your challenge to debate Mariology. That's not what we're here to debate tonight, but I hope, I pray that we will do that in the future. But I do need to point out that Mr. White does not understand the development of doctrine as the Catholic Church teaches. Just because there is not an infallible pronouncement on something does not mean that the children are not bound to follow the teachings of the elders. And that's a very important point, and I think our Catholic friends would do well to heed this. Remember, when the Holy Father speaks to the universal church on an issue of faith and morals, even if he is not speaking ex cathedra, we are still bound to follow that teaching. And no, in those situations, we do not have infallible certainty. Absolutely. I agree, Mr. White. So you're right. The Old Testament people of God did not have infallible certainty on the canon. Hence, you had all the different canons. That proves my point, folks. You don't need Scripture alone. In fact, Mr. White pointed out in Josiah what happened when they lost the Scripture. Well, it's true. We need the Scripture. But... The church, the Old Testament church, went right along, didn't it, without the sacred scriptures. Why? Because you also had a tradition and you also had an authoritative uh, magisterium, a teaching authority. But again, I want to emphasize that, and this is a misnomer, that it's only the infallible teachings of the church that we have to follow. That is simply not true. If there is not an infallible teaching, then what do you do? You Acknowledge, you study to show yourself approved. There is much freedom, in fact, in the Catholic Church on these issues. But the key difference is this, folks. The Bible teaches plainly that Jesus gave authority to his church to declare the word of God for us so that we can, in situations where there is major disagreement on essential issues concerning the doctrine of the faith, there is a man who can walk in and say, just as I said, thus saith God, there shall be one shepherd, one fold, one sheepfold. That is the promise we have in sacred scripture. So, Mr. White, once again, I I have to ask you, you're the one who is teaching Sola Scriptura. You need to demonstrate to me from the scriptures, I'm going to hold you to this, what in fact the scriptures are. You keep turning this thing on me. I've answered you now. Understand me. That in the early centuries of the church, when the bishops were in dispute over what the canon was, there was certain liberty. That's why we don't condemn uh, St. Clement of Alexandria for accepting books of Scripture that we don't today. There was legitimate freedom. But, folks, what we see throughout the history of the church, as I demonstrated from the Word of God, that when a situation arises that needs clarification, the church has authority to speak by the power of the Holy Spirit, and that is an infallible authority. And I'm going to ask you again my, in my second challenge that you didn't respond to, to demonstrate to me what the gospel is. And this is very important, folks. He wants to gloss over this issue. But the fact is, folks, we have the reality of things like this. The Augsburg Confession disagrees with the Westminster Confession on baptismal regeneration. Now, Mr. White doesn't believe in baptismal regeneration. Many Protestants do. The Augsburg Confession does. Martin Luther did. Of course... When we get to issues like this, what usually happens is the Protestant will say, oh, well, that's a peripheral, that's a peripheral issue, baptism. Even though for 2,000 years it is the unanimous consent of the church that baptismal regeneration is a dogma of the faith, and I don't think Martin Luther would agree with you that baptism is a peripheral issue. Dr. Walter Martin, whom many of you know and respect, wrote in his book, The Kingdom of the Cult, he taught that Jesus Christ is not the eternal Son, but he is the eternal Word who became the Son. Folks, we're talking about another Jesus here. And we could go on when it comes to salvation. And here's a central doctrine I'm sure Mr. White would agree. Salvation. Do you know how many different doctrines of salvation we have in the Protestant churches? We could bring Chuck Smith up on this stage, and he would categorically disagree with James White on justification, whether you can lose your state of grace, whether free will is involved, whether 
grace is resistible, double predestination. We could go on, Mr. White and, and Chuck Smith would disagree. And we could go from Protestant church to Protestant church and we get all these different things. And let me ask you something. If the word of God is sufficient, are these not men of God? Didn't Mr. White just quote 2 Timothy 3.16 and say that Scripture is all we need to equip the man of God? If that is the case, then friends, how can we how can we say that the church, and I would suggest to you folks, if you recall from St. Basil, when he said, I, I think this is a very important point, when Basil, whom Mr. White had misquoted, said that we need to hold to the unwritten traditions as well as the traditions, he said, if we cut off from ourselves the unwritten traditions, we end up reducing the kerygma to just a word. That is exactly what has happened in Protestantism, folks. The kerygma has been reduced to nothing more than a word. Why? Because there is no one in the Protestant churches who can say, Thus saith God. Therefore, as a Protestant, you will always be uncertain. You will never have the certainty of faith out of which a true hope can flow. And that's what we offer in the Catholic Church. Now, again, um, perhaps in the rebuttal period, I will respond. Am I out of time? Oh, 30 seconds. <laughs> 20 now. Perhaps in the rebuttal period, I will get to the bodily assumption and some of these charges that my opponent has made. That's not the issue of the debate, but I'll respond anyway. And I want you to remember, I have agreed, we will debate these issues in the future in full. And I will demonstrate to you how that I came to believe in the bodily assumption of Mary through sola scriptura. And I invite those of you who don't know to get a hold of my tapes on this issue, two tapes, on the bodily assumption and the other Marian doctrines and listen to them and listen to a Catholic response from the scriptures to Mr. White's charge. Thank you. So, now, we want to be able to respond to as many questions as possible. And so, even though it says in the program that uh, there will be five-minute responses and rebuttals to the questions, obviously we wouldn't get to very many if that were the case. And so, by mutual consent of the parties here, they will try to keep their answers to a minute or two, depending upon the, the nature of the question. That means, of course, that the questions are indeed questions, formulated as concisely as you can. And uh, if you have that natural inclination to want to bear witness to the truth, which is a very admirable thing. Just be content that your presence is sufficient witness. <laughs> and so if you have you're here and that shows and, and so just ask a question but please do not make any little commentaries or speeches or responses to what you have heard so much, but rather genuine questions that touch on the material. And so of course those who are going to ask questions uh, Mr. Staples are on this side. Those who are going to ask questions of uh, Mr. White are on this side. And so we'll begin uh, with Mr. White. First question, please. Good evening, Mr. White. Good evening. Um, I would just like to preface uh, my question very quickly with, uh, I won't read the whole scripture, I'll just uh, overview it on uh, Acts uh, 8, verses 27 to 31, mm -hmm. uh, the scripture where the eunuch is sitting in the chariot chariot uh, reading the book of Isaiah and as he's doing that Philip goes up to him and asks him do you understand what you are reading and uh, the eunuch responds how can I understand unless some man showeth me well if I were a non-believer and I were to open the Bible and try to uh, get the correct authority to interpret the Bible for me, which church would I rely on for that authority? Would I try to filter through the 25,000 different Christian denominations? Would I try to go to the Book of Mormon? Would I try to Jehovah's Witness? Or would I try the, uh, <clears throat> the Baptist church that was established in the 19th century? How would you respond to that? Is that a liturgically significant thing you're just doing? <laughs> I'm a Baptist, I don't know. Actually, yes, but its liturgical significance is different. It's like a musical symbol. 
the question is based upon Acts chapter 8 in the Ethiopian. And unfortunately, it, it goes again to this issue that seemingly uh, a dichotomy is trying to, trying to be presented here. That either you have an infallible church or you have no church at all. And you're just you and your Bible out in the woods, no Holy Spirit, no church, no nothing. You see, the issue again is the issue of infallible authority. I have never claimed, and Protestants do not claim, and, Protest- and Sola Scriptura does not assert that God does not use means to explain his truth, that God does not use the church to grow people up. That's never, ever been a claim, and unfortunately it keeps being raised as, as a canard, as a misrepresentation. The issue is, what is the infallible authority to which that Ethiopian eunuch turned? He turned to the scriptures. Philip was used to explain those scriptures to him, and we can be very thankful that he was. I've had the opportunity to explain the scriptures to many people, and I'm thankful for that opportunity. In fact, I've explained the scriptures to many Jehovah's Witnesses, believe it or not. But that didn't make me infallible. The word is what is infallible. And I just remind you of what Theodoret said. The doctrine of the church should be proven, not announced. Therefore, show that the scriptures teach these things. That's what Philip did. And that is not in any way, shape, or form a denial of sola scriptura. To say that it is is to misunderstand what the doctrine actually is. I think the uh, scripture you raise is, is an excellent one because it demonstrates the fact that the scripture is not sufficient. It does not interpret itself. And when the Ethiopian eunuch asks the question, how can I, unless somebody show me, that is there for a reason. That scripture was written in the context of a community for a reason, to demonstrate to us the fact that we need the scripture. In fact, the scripture is not sufficient on its own. In 2 Peter chapter 3, I referred to earlier, St. Peter tells us that, the, and, and I don't know if I made this point sufficiently, <laughs> uh, an account the long-suffering of our Lord, salvation, soterion, as our most dear brother Paul, according to the wisdom God given, hath written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are certain things hard to be understood, and the undiscipled an unstable rest. I was reading Professor Bloom, who is an evangelical scholar, and his interpretation of this passage when it says that we are not to, uh, in, in uh, Second Peter earlier, in chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, it says, understand this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is made by private interpretation. He makes the point here that the reason why the, this epistle is written, one of the main themes is that people were, in fact, privately interpreting the scripture apart from the church. Now, I'm sure uh, Dr. Bloom would argue the, uh, the analogy of faith or something to that regard, but I think it's important that here an evangelical acknowledges that this verse is talking, it's actually condemning private interpretation of scripture. Did you know that? It's condemning private interpretation. Now, it doesn't mean we can't interpret scriptures even, you know, get together, exegete scripture together and so forth. But it does say something about who is the final authority. Because when you read later on there in the verses I just read, what does Peter say about those who are, uh, are giving this private interpretation? I think in this context, he says that they are resting the, the scriptures to their own destruction. And notice the word is unlearned. That's amathes, which means undiscipled not discipled by proper authority. That's what you see throughout the New Testament. The church has the power to bind and loose. Whatever she binds on earth is bound in heaven. That's the clear teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. I get a little extra time since we want a minute over. Well, can I make one comment? You certainly may, yes. Yes, he talks about those who are undiscipled, Mr. Staples. So disciple, that's what the church is called to do. That doesn't mean that you substitute a different infallible rule. Instead, you do what Christ calls the church to do, to disciple. Question for Mr. Staples. Yes, sir. Well, now he responded, so I can respond to his response. <laughs> <laughs> if it says undisciple, you have to these, make a distinction. These dear, these dear people here, they oh, have these so dear many people. questions. Think how they're waiting here patiently. 
My turn. Okay. Tim, uh, yes. you say that the uh, church is infallible, yet when I look at the church tradition, I see that the Fourth Lateran Council conferred a special indulgence on people who would, by use of the sword, help to exterminate heretics. There were sub several subsequent papal decrees that affirmed this as well. Mm -hmm. When I read Vatican II, that seems to be contradicted. Uh, well, number one, that's a gro that is a distortion of the Fourth Lateran Council, and it's rooted in a misunderstanding of the word extermino. It does not mean to exterminate. It means to drive out. Now, extermino, when, when you see that word, you might be thinking in English and say, oh, that means go out and murder and, and, and kill. That's not what it's saying. To drive out the heretics. Now, we have to understand the context in which this council was held. We're talking about a different culture. Folks, we had Christendom. There were Christian nations. And if we had a Christian nation where people decide, wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it just be terrible if we had a, a Christian nation that decided that things like abortion were wrong? And if you did that, you could be prosecuted? Wouldn't that be terrible? No, I would suggest to you that'd be a good thing. But, you see, I think Americans, because we're in a non-Christian culture, we are so... You know, into this notion, I think it's a false notion of freedom that's not freedom at all, that the, the purpose of government is supposed to be to give us every freedom in the world, freedom to have abortion, freedom to do, do this or that. No. You see, in the 13th century, it was believed that to, to um, understand, and I said this on the radio with James, that heresy was considered a worse sin than murder. Why? Because when you fall into the sin of heresy, you're not just killing bodies, you're killing souls. Now, there is no contradiction between Vatican II and the Fourth Lateran Council. We live in a different age. And obviously, in the age that we live in, we're not going to be saying we're going to uh, go out and drive out the heretics from, from America. Why? Because we don't have Christian nations anymore. But I would suggest to you that if the world was Christian and we had Christian kings, don't you think that it would be a good thing to drive out, let's say, those who would want to murder babies in the womb? I mean, wouldn't it be a good thing? Now, I'm not saying to exterminate them, but I am saying you make laws so that you can have a righteous nation. Let me tell you exactly what the Lateran Council said. It said, convicted heretics shall be handed over for due punishment to their secular superiors or the latter's agents, Catholics who assume the cross and devote themselves to the extermination of heretics shall enjoy the same indulgence and privilege as those who go to the Holy Land. Please compare that with Vatican II, which says this freedom means that all men are to be immune from coercion on the part of individuals or social groups of any human power. In such wise that in matters religious, no one is to be forced to act in a manner contrary to his own beliefs. This is the allegedly infallible tradition that we are asked by Mr. Staples to believe. And he says, well, but you need to realize they were in a different culture. God's infallible truth is defined by culture. Is that what we're asked, being asked to believe here? Now, let me ask you something. Then he uses the hot-button topic of abortion, and I stand against abortion, but I want to point something out to you. Same thing I pointed out on the radio. The Council of Constance killed Jan Hus, not for being an abortionist, but for believing that you're justified by faith alone in Jesus Christ and for translating the Bible into the Czech language so people read it for themselves. That's not abortion. If that's heresy, this tells you what happens when sola scriptura is abandoned. Because you see, the church was out of control. Why? Because there's no rule of faith left to correct her. She's become her own rule of faith. We see it in the Crusades. We see it in the Inquisition. This is what happens when the church no longer believes in sola scriptura. All right. Question for Mr. White. Good evening, Mr. White. Good evening. We've heard a lot this evening about 23 to 26,000 denominations. Does that mean that Protestants believe there are 23 to 26 churches? What is the church? Who is the true church? I won't even try to imitate the, uh, the, the accent. I love it. That's beautiful. No, obviously we have a very, very different view of the church. Mr. Staples has talked about how the mother speaks to the children. 
Do you know what that means about the church? We believe that the church is the body of Christ, all those who have been called by God into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ make up that church. It is a living communion in which we love one another in the bond of Jesus Christ. The church is not some organization that stands over us as a mother. We are the church. And the ministers in the church are called by God to pastor our souls, yes, but they are not on some higher level. With all due respect to our moderator, I do not believe that the New Testament in any way, shape, or form presents this difference between the quote-unquote clergy and the laity. One of the great scandals of the Reformation from the Roman Catholic perspective was the belief that each individual is a believer priest before God responsible for what he or she believes. And that each individual has direct and immediate access to God's truth, God's spirit, and God's throne through the finished work of Jesus Christ. You see, there are Christians that span all those however many denominations you want to create or say there are. They're not, I'm not sitting here, I've got Presbyterian friends here and people from other churches, and I'm not sitting here saying, well, it's my church versus their church. We are one in the bond of God's truth. But we do not solve our differences by abandoning the one infallible rule of faith God has given to us and substituting one that gives us an alleged infallibility and a unity based upon that. We stick with God's inspired word. Thank you. Well, I agree with what Mr. White said about we are the body of Christ. Absolutely. But within the body, there are many gifts. And Jesus gives authority. I, I want you to notice here throughout this evening what James White is arguing for. He is arguing for a church that has no way of pronouncing authoritatively what the truth is on a doctrine. He's arguing for anarchy, folks. And why do I say that? Now, listen, okay, before you... Now, don't think, now some of the products say, oh, you're, you're, you're crazy. Well, listen, this is a man, he sounds all lovey-dovey with you. But when you get down to the essence of what he believes, the majority, the overwhelming majority of you Protestants that are applauding him, he is diametrically opposed to when it comes to the issue of predestination, how a person is justified before God. He is opposed to many of you on issues like like the real presence of, of our Lord in the Eucharist, if you're, if you're Lutheran. He is opposed to you on many such issues, and yet... You're applauding him. Folks, in Protestants, we're talking about essential doctrines here. We're talk- I could go down a litany, folks, of, of doctrines. Like we could, you talk about moral doctrine. When I talk to evangel- evangelicals, it's like, what moral doctrine? Men like uh, Dr. Dobson in his book, and, and I love the guy. He's a, he's a sincere man. But here in Preparing for Adolescence, he says masturbation is not a sin. Why? Because the scripture doesn't say anything explicit about that. How about divorce and remarriage? Man, I have friends that are pastors that, that divorce, remarry, and don't miss a Sunday. Why? Because there is no one to say, thus saith God, this is the truth. You have disagreement in doctrine over whether you can, in fact, divorce and remarry in, in the Protestant churches. It depends what church you go to. Well, and if you want to divorce and remarry, just do what Henry VIII did. Check out and find one or maybe start one that agrees with you. Okay. Question for Mr. Staples. Mr. Staples. Romans 5 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. According to this verse and others, this justification is always spoken of as a past tense event. So, my question is how can the Catholic gospel be reconciled? Uh, to this justification according to a point in history? Well, first of all, the, the word, the, the verb you're talking about is dikaio, and I've got to make a, a correction there. Actually, the manuscript authority points to a subjunctive there. Let us have peace with God. Not we have peace, as the King James uh, will say, but at any rate, let's, you know, so uh, even if it did, we have peace with God. We agree. 
having been justified. How? Through baptism, through our incorporation into the body of Christ, which, by the way, is unanimously taught by the church fathers over 2,000 years, baptismal regeneration, which Mr. White rejects. I can, folks, he quotes the fathers. He loves the fathers. He loves to go to the fathers. But I challenge you, Mr. White, to honestly read what the fathers say about baptismal regeneration and tell me honestly that you can tell me that the Christianity does not believe in baptismal regeneration. But, folks, justification, having been justified, yes, through baptism we have peace with God. But, folks, remember, there is also a present participle used with that same verb, dikaio, in Romans 3.24, being justified, which implies an ongoing process. And I'll refer you to Galatians 2, verses 16 and 17, where we have a future passive of, of the verb dikaiosune, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. And by the way, the Catholic Church teaches that. We are not justified by the works of the law or any works that we do by our own strength. But we are justified by grace through faith that works itself out in love, as Galatians teaches in Galatians 5.6. But now, but knowing that man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, we also believe in Christ Jesus. And actually, that's a bad translation. We have an aorist there. The aorist is slightly irregular in Greek. But it is a past tense norm normally. We have believed in Christ Jesus in order that we might be justified. That's a future passive uh, by the faith of Jesus Christ, not by the works of the law, which the Catholic Church teaches, but by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. But if while we seek to be justified, notice Paul includes himself, I know I'm not out of time. If while we seek to be justified in Christ, we are found sinners, is Christ the minister of sin? God forbid, if I build up again the things which I destroyed, referring to the Old Testament law, I make myself parabatane, that is a covenant breaker, one who cuts himself off from God. Read Galatians chapter 5 in conclusion where Paul says, stand fast in the yoke, <laughs> in the, the faith and be not held again under the yoke of bondage. He says, you're made void of Christ, you who attempt to be justified by the works of the law, you have fallen from grace, for we through the Spirit, by faith, wait for the hope of justification. Folks, hope of, that means future, we don't have it yet. If you hope for it according to Romans 8, 24, you ain't got it yet. Not in fullness. There you have uh, Catholic obedience to the clergy. <laughs> He's so, a magisterium uh, three, three of minutes, one. Three minutes for Mr. White. Thank you very much. I congratulate uh, Mr. Staples on getting all of that in. I just wish most of the facts were accurate because they weren't. They sounded real good because they go real fast. And when you're really excited, you say a lot of things and everybody goes, wow, that guy's really into it. But I hope you take the tape and like turn it down to real slow speed and look Please at everything do. that was said. First of all, he said the verb in uh, Romans 5, 1, dikaiao, is in subjunctive. He's thinking of the verb echo, which is, uh, there's a textual variant there. Even all Roman Catholic scholars, however, go with the indicative there. The problem is with Mr. Staples' position is that, first of all, he made a number of assertions there in regards to the Greek language that um, just simply don't watch. The participle in the Greek language takes its tense from the main verb of the passage, and what he said about Romans 3.24 doesn't make any sense in light of that. Uh, it sounds real good, uh, but, and Mr. Staples talks about his students and stuff, I'm just going to have to ask Mr. Staples sometime to tell us what his expertise in that language is, why we should believe that. Uh, I teach the language. I am a professor of it, and I'm a critical consultant on a major translation. So I'm, at least I've done some background on that. I'd ask Mr. Staples to comment on that. The problem is, did you hear Mr. Staples then said after going, saying all that other stuff? Yes, we have been justified as a past tense action by baptism. What did Romans 5, 1 say? Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God for our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me say something. In Roman Catholicism, you can commit a mortal sin and lose the grace of justification and be an enemy of God. You can be justified and then be unjustified by committing a mortal sin. None of you in this room know that you're not going to commit a mortal sin by the time you go to bed this evening. Hence, the relationship you have with God could very well end this evening. The term peace, irene in the Greek, shalom in the Hebrew, is a very rich term. It does not simply mean a ceasefire. It means a fullness of relationship. It means a wellness. You see, my friends, this is an important issue, and I hope we get to debate justification someday. 
Because in point of fact, the difference between us on that issue is quite simply this. I have peace with God this evening, not because of anything I've done, not because of any merit I've earned, but because of one person and the work that he accomplished in my behalf perfectly 2,000 years ago. I stand before God and I have peace that cannot be destroyed simply because my Lord Jesus Christ is a perfect Savior. That is the difference. Question for Mr. White. I am fascinated by your uh, continuous confusion of the ter- of concept be- uh, of rule as if it was a judge. Uh, can you possibly give us a scriptural proof that the scripture is the judge in a controversy? Uh, what I mean by this is, where's the, if if I say that the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mary and the glorious Assumption of the, of the Virgin Mary are taught in Scripture, and you say no, where is the form where this dispute is resolved, and who pronounces the judgment as to which is right and which is the faith of the Church? We're finally on the topic tonight, hey? Every six months, I go to the General Conference of the LDS Church in Salt Lake City. I've done it past 25 General Conferences. Stand right outside the gates of the temple and pass out tracts to the Mormons. About 12 of us, about 30,000 of them. It feels sort of similar, right? And as I speak to those people, they stand there and, and I open up the Bible and I read them Isaiah 43:10. Before me there is no God formed, and there shall be none after me. Some of you may know Mormons are polytheists. They believe God was once a man lived on another planet. There are other gods besides from Him. And I show him that plain scripture standing outside the gates of the temple, and he says. Yeah, but you don't have any right to interpret that. You see, we have, a, we have a church and we have a prophet. And the prophet tells me that there's more than one God. And so, you know, you may show me that passage, but it doesn't really mean anything. How do I respond? Do I say, oh, no, I have an infallible authority in, um, in the Pope. And he says there is one God. And the Mormon says, oh, well, but my infallible authority, the bishop, the, uh, the priest, uh, the prophet in Salt Lake City says there isn't one. Is that what we're reduced to? Is your ultimate authority versus his ultimate authority? Or has God spoken clearly? Does anyone in this room actually doubt that a serious, in-depth exegesis of the 43rd chapter of Isaiah would not demonstrate the truth of monotheism? Is that what we're actually... Are we actually being told the scriptures are so muddled, so unclear, they cannot teach this? I certainly hope not. And so the question that you're asking is, well, we want... We don't want to do exegesis. We want someone to tell us to believe this, and then it'll be infallible. Not what the scriptures call us to do. What do the scriptures call us to do? To be a workman who is diligent in studying the word of God so he can handle accurately the word of truth. Well, I want you to notice, uh, before you applaud, that he didn't respond to the question. (laughs) First of all. Yes, I did, Mr. Sable. He didn't didn't give the scripture. I have demonstrated to you, folks. Go back to Matthew chapter 18, and you read it. You pray, you get before God, and you tell me that the New Testament teaches sola scriptura. When you go to the Bible, and you read Matthew chapter 18, and we could get, pick a page, folks, but I, 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 I pray that you will, and honestly, search, God, search your heart before God. Now, as far as the Mormons go, well, the Mormons, James White says, they say they have an authority, and you Catholics say you have an authority, so see... Well, folks, it it will take about 15 seconds to dismiss the Mormon. Started in 1822, they are eliminated from the possibility of being the church Jesus Christ established. End of story. Now, folks, it's not what we want here. He says we want to have this this authority over us to speak the word. It's not what we want. It's what the the historic Christian faith has taught for 2,000 years demonstrated in her ecumenical councils over 21 of them, 21 of them over 2,000 years. It's not what we want. This is what the Christian church, the true church of Jesus Christ has taught for 2,000 years. It's what God has given us, the gift 
of the church so that we be not henceforth children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. And once again, Mr. White didn't answer the question where I gave you the formula that Jesus gives us when there is a disagreement. Mr. White has yet to give us the formula where Jesus says, now, if you disagree, what you do, get your Bibles and start arguing passages. And if you don't agree with your pastor, well, then go start your own church, Martin Luther. Um, Listen, that is nowhere to be found in Scripture. I suppose that would suffice. Question for Mr. Staples. Mr. Staples, in Jude, the letter from Jude, we're told that the faith, the body of truth concerning Christ and our salvation, was delivered to all the saints, not to a magisterium, not to a select group of people who alone can decode the Word of God for the masses. As a saint of God, as a believer in Jesus Christ, I've sought to understand authentically the Word of God by the help of the Holy Spirit. I cannot find in the Word of God any teaching concerning Mary's immaculate conception and her protection from original sin. We're told in Psalms that we are estranged from the womb and we are born in sin and shaping in our mother's womb and iniquity. I cannot find in the Word of God... We, should, we better keep um, it to one question, because you've just asked about four, so... I, no, it's, I, it's one question, Mary, because... Okay, the, what's the question, then? I've just stated it. I know if, if well, I, first you, you, you asked about authority, and now you're asking about Mary, and a couple of things about yeah, Mary. Because, yeah, the authority from the Word of God. I mm-hmm. seek to authentically understand God's Word. According to Jude, I have that right. Because the faith has been delivered to the okay, saints. Okay, well, I, I think you need to give me a little more time. All right, first of all, uh, Jude. Can I just add uh, one other thing? Then the onus, oh, boy. Yeah, the onus is upon you, not, not just um, our brother, to show from Scripture and history. And you haven't done it tonight, so please address it, where we see a unity in the saints and a, and a, a compliance with Scripture regarding the doctrine of Mary as the Roman Catholic Church announces it. Okay, the first point is on Jude. You said the faith was once for all delivered. We agree, absolutely. The faith was once and for all delivered. However, my brother, be honest. You know that the Scripture teaches so plainly that there are different functions in the body of Christ. You mean to tell me that the apostles... Here's one we all agree with. Let's not talk about apostolic succession. We all agree. You mean to tell me that the apostle Paul doesn't have any more authority than anybody else? Oh, but this says it's once for all delivered to the saints. By the way, I love your accent. You need to come back to the church. But, um, listen, I just had to get that. I love that Irish accent. It was delivered once for all to the saints, folks. Well, guess what? That includes the apostles. So if I'm going to exegete that passage the way you do, then I'll have to say that the apostles, oh, they don't have any more authority than anybody else, and I can just disagree with Paul when I want to. Well, that's absurd. Second point, okay, well, the point is, is that there is authority in the body of Christ, and I would suggest to you it didn't stop with the apostles. And this is what we see throughout the history of the church, and we need to debate this point at length, that from Clement to Ignatius forward, we see an authoritative church. We do not see sola scriptura anywhere. Now, as far as Mary goes, you say, well, show me in scripture. And I I told you earlier, as a Protestant, I came to believe in Marian doctrines through the scripture alone. I came to see, for example, uh, if we're going to talk about Mary as mother of God, we see it in Luke 143. She's the mother of God. I guarantee you there are a number of people here. You're Protestant. You don't believe Mary's the mother of God. James White does. I do. Why? Because Jesus is God. And to deny that, to deny that Mary is the mother of God is to end in heresy. It's called the Nestorian heresy, which denies that, that Jesus is one person. Why? Because if you say Mary is not the mother of God, then what is she? She's the mother of the man Jesus. And guess what? We have two Jesuses then. So we see Mary as the mother of God. Secondly, oh gosh, i got two minutes. Well, as far as the Immaculate Conception goes, yes, there are... A, Let me refer to St. Jerome, who said, in fact, he was defending the perpetual virginity of Mary when he he writes that Mary is the gate represented in Ezekiel chapter 44, verses 1 and 2. And notice it says, uh, Ezekiel has a vision of the gate and the spirit passes through 
I believe it's the east gate. And then God says, let that gate be shut and never be opened again. And St. Ambrose tells us, this shows us the perpetual virginity of Mary. What about the Immaculate Conception? Well, in Luke chapter 1, verse 28, we see Mary is named Kekaritomene. That's a name. It's a verb form, but it's a name. It's a perfect passive participle, which means one who has been filled or perfected in grace, which is the way St. Jerome translated it. And I think he knew Greek. Full of grace, which means she, she has no stain upon her, as Amber says, as St. Augustine said in his work on the grace and nature. Let me be perfectly clear about Mary that she is free from all stains of sin. And I don't know if I got that, exact, that quote exactly right, but let me tell you something, folks. I again challenge you, and we will debate this issue, to get my tapes on this. Obviously, I can't explicate this, this fully in this short period of time that I have. But there is, I guarantee you, a lot more, immeasurably more scripture for our Marian doctrines than the, than the one scripture, actually half a scripture, one subordinate clause that Mr. White uses to prove sola scriptura outside of it is written here or there, which we, Jesus saying it is written, big deal. He also says, I say unto you, folks, remember, he, he could not prove sola scriptura. He uses one little verse, and the other verses are, are even more ridiculous than the one he uses for sola scriptura. I can give you much more for Mary. Get my tapes. Well, he has it's a four. It's a four minutes for Mr. White. Of course, it pains the priest to cut someone off about the Blessed Mother, but it's necessary. Fair. Since Mr. Staples is advertising tapes, I debated Mr. Jerry Matatix on Long Island in August of this year on the Marian doctrines, each of these specific passages. If you want an example of using one verse, and it is, I think we can all tell, Tim's getting a little excited to say that my doctrine of soul scripture is based upon one verse. We obviously know that's not the case. He's getting a little excited. But if you want one verse, look at using Ezekiel to prove perpetual virginity. Look at using Luke 128 and Kakara Tomene to prove immaculate conception. You want one verse, eisegesis? This is the classic example of it. And here's a, an excellent example of something else. You see, Mr. Staples believes in the immaculate conception against tradition. I can point... Ludwig Ott, Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma, lists the early church fathers who believed that Mary committed personal sin. This is the Roman Catholic source published by that liberal place called Pan. Where did the concept of perpetual virginity first come from? Where is it first found, Mr. Staples? Code Evangelium of James and the Ascension of Isaiah, Gnostic works of the second century. Bodily Assumption, the transitist literature of the fifth century, heretical. These are not biblical teachings. This is not biblical exegesis. And the only reason that one could possibly say that one believes these doctrines is because of sola ecclesia. The early church didn't believe these things. The Bible doesn't teach these things. And hence, to say, I believe these things, is to demonstrate that you are functioning with an ultimate authority beyond what the scriptures themselves teach. Now, Mr. Staples says, now, well, see, Mr. White, he's over there saying that there is no authority in the church. He keeps misrepresenting me on that. In fact, I, I, I'm sorry, but over and over again, over again, he says, in the early church, we have an authoritative church. Therefore, they couldn't have believed in sola scriptura. My friend, I believe in an authoritative church. My church exercises discipline. My church says divorce is wrong. My church says all those things on the basis of the Word of God. I know all sorts of other Protestant churches that do that. So I guess these arguments don't have anything to do with that, do they? Sola Scriptura is not a denial of the church having the authority to do what the Scriptures define for her to do. Sola Scriptura is a denial that the church is herself an infallible rule of faith. And so I have to ask Tim, Tim, you're a nice guy, but why can't you represent Sola Scriptura properly? If I sat up here, and, and I'll admit, Patrick Madrid did the exact same thing we debated this. 
Patrick Madrid used a, a definition of sola scriptura that I never gave. And when we pointed this out later, later, Carl Keating said, well, he didn't have to. He doesn't have to debate the definition you give. If I got up here and debated a different definition of the Immaculate Conception than what Rome has officially and dogmatically declared, Mr. Staples would be crying foul up one side and down the other. You're misrepresenting. You must not have a good answer because you have to keep misrepresenting my position. So, Mr. Staples, if you really have these wonderful answers, for the claims of the sufficiency of Scripture to function as the sole and fallible rule of faith of the church, why do you have to keep misrepresenting what sola scriptura means? That's the question I think we all have to consider. Thank you. Question for Mr. White. Good evening, Mr. White. Good I evening. Want you to... I can't see you, but I'll look over that general direction and sort of... I want you to respond to this. If Jesus Christ believed in Sola Scriptura, why didn't he take his hand and write the New Testament himself, and you would have no reason to sit here? It would be done, and everybody would agree, to write it himself. He had plenty of time. Why didn't he do it? I'm afraid, obviously, that I've either failed to explain it, or you failed to listen to what Sola Scriptura is. Because the question has absolutely nothing to do with Sola Scriptura. Jesus Christ, in a very true way, did exactly what you're saying. He did exactly what you're saying. I believe that every word of this book is theanusos, and I believe that God is the theos. I believe that Jesus Christ is the theos. Therefore, this is his word. It is the word of Christ. He did it through other people. He did it through Paul. He did it through his apostles. It is no less authoritative because of that. Even if he had taken his own hand, that wouldn't change anything. When, when the Holy Spirit of God brings about the writing of Scripture, how is that different than if God had, had used his own hand to do it? Are the Ten Commandments, because God used his own finger to write them, more inspired than what we have in the New Testament? Of course not. There aren't different levels of inspiration in that way. The issue, even and from a Roman Catholic perspective, there is no question about the authority, at least from Mr. Staples, Roman Catholic perspective. I can find Roman Catholic theologians to fill this place up that would think our entire debate this evening was absurd because it's based on the idea that the Bible is an infallible revelation from God. And you know that. You know that the arguments you've got between traditionalists and modernists and all the rest of that stuff. But we aren't debating that because Mr. Staples believes that the Scriptures are the infallible Word of God, that they are revelation. The issue is not, well, if Jesus had written it, then that would take care of everything. No, if Jesus had written this, you'd still have churches saying, well, you can't properly understand it unless we tell you how to interpret it. You'd still have the same thing going on. It wouldn't have, quote, unquote, solved any problem. It doesn't get us past the fact that this is the infallible, the ultimate and final authority, and we are being asked to believe that there's another ultimate final authority along with it. And I deny that that, uh, that claim. Well, I think we're back on the issue of, of authority, and I just want to make this point. I think the key difference between us this evening is that we believe, and uh, Mr. White said on the radio and he said earlier today, uh, that the book is a lie. The scriptures are a lie. And he quoted Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, which is quoting a verse entirely out of context. Why? Because, listen, let me read it to you. It says, The Word of God is living and effectual, more piercing than any two-edged sword, reaching to the division of soul, spirit, joints, and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature invisible in His sight. But all things are naked and open to His eyes. It's referring to a person. You see, when we're talking about the Word of God... A lot of times, and, and I understand this, I was Protestant, you're thinking Scripture, when in reality the Word of God is first a person, Jesus Christ, second, it's orally proclaimed, thirdly, and down the line, historically, it was recorded in Scripture. Further, we have, we believe, not just a living book, but a living body on this earth. A living body on this earth. Now, hold on, listen, listen, listen. A living body on this church, which includes a head, a visible head. And Jesus gave us that head in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And whatever he binds on earth shall be bound in heaven. Why? So that, folks, 
the words of Jesus Christ, as Babel says, the kerygma does not become a mere word. Because if you do not have an authority to say, thus saith God, what happens? 23 denominations. That's a fact. Mr. White talks about, oh, there are theologians that dissent from the, Holy, from, from the Catholic teaching. Sure there are. But the difference is, folks, we read Luke 10, 16. If they hear you, they hear me. If they reject you, they reject me. And that verse is alive and well in the Catholic Church because we have bishops to whom that verse is written, and they can do it. They can walk in this room right now and say, Thus saith God. And the question is settled. Folks, don't settle for the anarchy of Protestantism. We have the fullness of truth, 2,000 years of it, in fact, in the Catholic Church. Yes, Mr. Staples, uh, in one of your rebuttals earlier this evening, I believe I quoted you correctly here as saying, faith must be rooted in an infallible source. Right. I have a compound question for you. What is that infallible source, and how do we know that it's infallible? Okay, well, first of all, the way we know that, I mean, you're getting to basic apologetics here. Who is Jesus? Well... If we're going to be apologists, we have to investigate the claims of Christianity. Uh, certainly, we don't assume the scriptures are inspired. I believe that the Protestants come to the table with this. Well, and, uh, you know, you don't have any infallible authority to tell you the word of God is the word of God. You end up having a burning in your bosom. Well, I just know it's the word of God. Why? Well, it's testified to by the fathers. Well, the fathers disagree over many of the books of the Bible. And Mr. White still hasn't given us a biblical authority, a biblical a verse of Scripture that tells us what, in fact, the Word of God is. How do we know the book of Revelation is the Word of God? When you can make an argument in the first 300 years, perhaps the majority, perhaps, I mean, I, that rejected the book of Revelation and did not consider it to be inspired. But many bishops did, had a real hard time with that in other books. All right, so how do we know? We approach Jesus Christ as any other historical figure. If you're going to be an apologist and we can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt as apologists that Jesus Christ lived, died and was resurrected. He proved who he was through his miracles and he historically and I'm not accepting scriptures inspired here. But it is a historical fact that he established his church and it, as Augustine said, inaugurated it with miracles. And I would argue as the, that. The word of God continues to be confirmed through miracles for 2,000 years. And we have, folks, miracles in the Catholic Church. And I'm not talking about Benny Hinn and this, uh, oh, boy, my elbow hurt. Now, I'm, uh, you know, we're talking miracles here. I have a book at home of the miracles of the Lord, 65 documented. We're talking about restoration, creative miracles that demonstrate the validity of the Catholic Church as well throughout her history. So we approach this as skeptics and we see Jesus is real. He established a church. It, it proves itself over the centuries. And it is, in fact, that church that gives us the scripture. As Martin Luther himself in his commentary on John said, I would, we would know nothing of scripture except the Catholic Church gave it to us. And Augustine says the same thing in his epistle against the Manichaeans. So we must rely on the church for the scripture. Two minutes and 15 seconds for slide. Carl Keating in his book, Catholicism and Fundamentalism, which is on sale out there, I know, that says that we believe the Bible is inspired because the church tells us so. Putting it bluntly, sola ecclesia. Mr. Staples has said, well, you, we've got this spiral argument. You see, and if you start with this, then you assume this, and then you argue with that, and that's how you come to an infallible knowledge that the church is infallible? No, my friend. You see, if Mr. Staples looked at that early church history that he says demonstrates his church, he would see so many facts that are directly contrary to Roman Catholic teachings today. He would see fathers. He would, he would see no pope. He would see Cardinal Newman admitting that there was no pope functioning in the church for centuries. He'd see the Council of Nicaea in the sixth canon limiting the authority of the Bishop of Rome as other bishops. He would see the Council of Chalcedon in the 28th canon doing the same thing. But you see, those facts have to be explained away. Why? Because of sola ecclesia. The church he believes in today tells him, well, those things don't mean what they meant back then. So history has to be changed. You see, 
there were early fathers who disagreed with Roman Catholic teachings today. So if that's a valid argument for Mr. Staples to say, well, there were people who disagreed on what the canon of Scripture was. So therefore, you can't just say you believe in the inspiration of Scripture. You've got to have a church to tell you. Well, there are people who disagreed with the, what the church taught back then. Does that mean you've got to have another source of authority to tell you that the church is true? Mr. Staples doesn't want to give us an infallible source of authority to tell us the church is true outside of what? The church. And yet, if I use arguments to demonstrate the truth of the scripture, ah, but Mr. White, you can't give us an infallible passage, see, you know. That's why you have to see that there are two positions being presented here and apply the same arguments to both. Because the arguments Mr. Staples uses contradict his own position. If his position is allowed to be put out there in its fullness and examined, and that's what we need to do. Question for Mr. White. You said that um, Scripture is infallible. I yeah. agree with that. Now, the Holy Spirit is infallible. Yeah. If it was to interpret a doctrine, that doctrine would be infallible, correct? Mm -hmm. And you said the church has authority mm -hmm. to interpret Scripture. Are you, the doctrine, or your church's doctrine, infallible? That's right. Excellent question. Mr. Staples has continually said that as a Protestant, I'm sorry, let me start my watch here. As a Protestant, well, Tim doesn't mind, so why should I start mine? As a Protestant, I cannot say, thus saith the Lord. That is wrong. I believe in apostolic succession. You know what I mean by that? If you want to stand in the succession of the apostles, then teach and preach what the apostles taught and preached. And let me tell you something. You may claim some historical connection to the apostles, but if you don't teach and preach what they taught and what they preached, don't claim to be a successor of theirs. You know, Mr. Staples rather flippantly dismissed the problem he'd have if he went up to Salt Lake City. I would love... Tim, you're invited... General conferences, first weekend in October, first weekend in April, every year. I'd like to see you use that answer you used here outside the gates of the Mormon temple with about a dozen Mormon elders. I sure have. I'd like, I'd like to see you do that. I can dismiss them in 15 seconds. No, that doesn't work, friend. It doesn't work at all. We can preach God's truth with authority without me becoming infallible. As long as I am faithful to this word, then what I preach is God's word, and it's binding upon those who hear it. I don't have to become an infallible authority alongside this to preach with authority. That's a misnomer. It's a, it's a complete misrepresentation, and it's illogical. It makes no sense. When we preach the word of God and proclaim the gospel of God from these scriptures, it is binding upon those who hear it, and it only gets in the way of the gospel to make me an authority besides God's word. So, no, I'm not in The bottom line is, then, there can be no certainty of faith in Protestantism. Why? Because, once again, I will tell you, Mr. White is making the argument for anarchy. He's saying, I'm not certain, and by golly, you can't be either. Why? Because, folks, it is demonstrated. Listen, is he infallible? Does he have certainty regarding his doctrines? Well, guess what? Let's sit down. I would love to get some of my Protestant friends out there right now to come up here and debate Mr. White on things like baptismal regeneration, if you believe in that. The real presence of our Lord in the Eucharist. How about double predestination? How many are going to raise their hand and believe that? That God chooses some for heaven, some for hell. Double predestination. Mr. White believes that. He's talking about this gospel, 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 folks. But without the church that Jesus Christ established, you have no authority. And unfortunately, people, many, many souls are being lost because there is no standard. You claim the scripture is your, your authority. But it is not the scripture. Mr. White, it is your interpretation of the scriptures. 
and you are not infallible. Therefore, the words of our Lord in Luke 10, 16, if they hear you, they hear me, they reject you, they reject me, do not apply to Mr. White. He cannot say that. All he can say is, well, if I'm speaking in accordance with Scripture, then that applies to me. But he can't know if he is, because he's not infallible, folks. So what do you have? 23,000 denominations and counting. Hi, Tim. My name's Alan. I'm a Lutheran Christian, and I, I can't let something go. Lutherans do not believe in baptism and regeneration. We do not believe that... The I'm sorry, actually... the Augsburg Confession teaches baptismal regeneration. Martin Luther taught it. Now, I understand some evangelical Lutherans do not believe in baptismal regeneration, but you cannot say that all Lutherans do not believe. I'm sorry, many, many Lutherans do. Okay, you, don't, um, you haven't read Luther's small catechism. We believe that you're saved by faith alone. We do not believe the water just splash water on people and they become Christians. So the Augsburg Confession does not teach baptism regeneration, nor does our church. We teach justification by faith alone. My question for you is, uh, the Roman Catholic Church tells us that Matthew 16:18 teaches papal infallibility. The Eastern Orthodox Church does not believe this. Now, when an Eastern Orthodox Christian or a Lutheran Christian goes to Matthew 16:18 and says, I don't see the word pope, I don't see the word infallibility, I don't see these things being passed through down through time. You, as a Roman Catholic, just say, well, you can't interpret Scripture. I want to know, why, how can you believe and defend something that is circular reasoning and therefore is logically incoherent? Well, first of all, I've got some friends in the Missouri Synod uh, Lutheran Church that would strongly disagree with you in saying that they do not believe in baptismal regeneration. I, need, I think you need to check your facts on that. There are some Lutherans who do not believe in baptismal regeneration. But are you going to tell me? I mean, I have a a friend, a good friend, who was raised in Missouri Synod Lutheran. And, well, here we go. Proving my point once again. I'm not here to argue that the Lutheran Church is, is the way to go, because obviously you have disagreements within the Lutheran Church over the essential issues as well. Now you mentioned uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Well, you say, uh, how can you possibly believe that that verse teaches papal authority? Folks, this has been the constant teaching of the church for two thousand years. Now, Mr. White's going to quote Lenoy and his little survey. I've got 16 fathers that say this, 16 fathers. Folks, we're going to debate papal infallibility. We don't have the time to get into all those details right now. But we have clear passages of Scripture that teach, one, Jesus said to Peter, thou art the rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. And I will give to you, if you, don't, if you don't even believe in the rock, he gave Peter the keys, the authority. And everybody knows that it's a symbol of authority. What? For what? Over the kingdom of heaven on earth. I give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now listen, it's one thing for you to say, oh, how can you say that? How can you interpret passage of scripture like that? Folks, folks. I have scores of fathers of the church, councils like Chalcedon, that uh, Mr. White has misrepresented in, in, in Canon 28, and Nicaea, which he misrepresented with Canon 6. But see, these issues, folks, we need to hash out at another time because, unfortunately, we don't have the time to get into them. But don't tell me that, that we don't have Scripture to support our claim. We, we've we used Matthew 16, John 21, Luke 22. And we use the book of Acts, and there are so many other verses of Scripture, much more than the one verse of Scripture that, that my opponent has used. And I, and I say again, you cannot point me to Scriptures where Jesus says it is written and say that means sola scriptura. I mean, that, that is absolutely absurd. There is one verse that he can even twist sola scriptura out of, and boy, is he resting the Scriptures to do that. I again repeat. One verb in a subordinate clause of one scripture to prove a doctrine that's supposed to be the foundation of the Christian church for 2,000 years? I think not, folks. And I encourage you again, give my tapes on the papacy where I prove beyond a shadow of a doubt what Matthew 16, 18 is talking about. Don't listen to his smokescreen about Lenoy's uh, survey. 
three minutes for Mr. White. I've never heard so many lies in three minutes in my life. I'm serious. Not one line. I, I cannot believe that Mr. Staples... I cannot believe that Mr. Mr. Staples, do you have this book? Tim, do you have this book? Yes. Then you've read what it says about Sola Scriptura. Why do you keep saying I base it on one verse when you know it's not true? It talks about the early church fathers. It talks you're about wrong the, in the book in there. It and you're provides wrong the direct citation. If you want tapes, pick up the tape. And please, I, I know a lot of you are his friends. I know you're going to believe whatever he has to say. I'm just asking you to think about what he's just said. There is no serious Roman Catholic historian on this planet that will say what he just said. I invite <laughs> any one of you. Listen, listen, please. How, do, how, many, how many of you have ever looked in the early church fathers to the interpretation of Luke 22, John 21? Come on. Who's the early one, earliest one to use it? Pick up my debate six, more, six plus hours against Jerry Maddox during the papal visit in 1993 in Denver and find out for yourself. Mr. Staples is sitting there saying, I prove without a doubt. I, is Mr. Staples infallible? He's not an infallible interpreter of my books, obviously, because he misrepresents them at every turn. He's not an infallible interpreter of the early fathers because I can provide you with quote after quote. And I do, right here. Mr. Staples says, well, I do this. Here it is. And I've provided them to Mr. Staples. I sent them to him in letters months ago. He has never refuted them. Never. And he admitted in a response that he would have to change his presentation on the papacy in light of the information I presented to him. So I can't believe he would sit here in front of you and say, for 2,000 years, the church has believed this about Matthew 16. That is untrue. Let me quote Dr. Dr. Jackson. In truth, the supremacy of the Roman See, as, as it has been understood in later times, was hardly at the time of Basil on the horizon. No bishop of Rome had even been president at Nicaea or at Sardica, where a certain right of appeal to his see was conceded. A bishop of Rome signed the Sirmian blasphemy. No bishop of Rome was present to save the world from the lapse of Ariminum. The great intellectual Arian war was fought out without any claim of Rome to speak. Half a century after Basil's death, great Orientals were quite unconscious of this supremacy. And Mr. Mr. Now, I, Mr. Staples sits there and says, Mr. White misrepresented the sixth canon of the Council of Nicaea. Prove it. Okay. Get it out right now. You're sitting on your desk. Mm -hmm. He says he misrepresents the 28th canon of the Council of Chalcedon. Sitting right there on your desk. Prove it. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I don't in here. I ask for documentation. If you're going to make accusations, sir, back them up. Back them up. Okay, well, then I must. All right. First of all, the can Wait can a minute. Okay. Okay. What's that? First of all, the question was asked to him, so it's, it's next time for another person. Oh, wonderful. So, yeah. The fairness here is wonderful. What, 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 he should get double, double responses. I like that. You have the priest to defend you, though, so. <laughs> um, it seems to me that there's a, a logical contradiction in your position on the canon, and I'm wondering it, how is it that you can know with absolute certainty that the letter of Philemon, the contents of it, for example, are infallible, and yet you don't know that the letter of Philemon as a whole is part of an infallible canon. It's very interesting. I have the exact same level of certainty about Philemon that you have about the church. Mr. Staples just presented an argument for why he believes the church is infallible that was based upon what? Well, you look at this, and you look at the history, and you look at that. And if that's enough to prove that the church is infallible, why can't I have the exact same, and I'm maybe I hope you're able to hear this as you're leaving, but why can't I have the exact same type of level of certainty on the same basis? It's, it's, it's an inconsistent response. The canon is given by God. Can't, the canon is determined by God's act of inspiration. That makes it a revealed truth, but it's a part of Scripture. Now, I answer the same question. How can I have infallible knowledge of every bit of content of the Bible? I don't have infallible knowledge of every bit of the content of the Bible. Sufficient knowledge, just like the Jews that Jesus said, you are accountable for the Scriptures. Mr. Staples says they didn't have any infallible authority, but they were held accountable. Why can't I? I don't understand why people will not deal with this issue other than saying, well, just like my friends in Salt Lake City do, they say, you can't even know what's in the Bible because you don't have the prophet to tell you. 
Can I say, yes, I can. Oh, no, you can't. You need to have someone to tell you. You need the golden index. Now, they don't say that, but I call this the golden index syndrome. And Mr. Staples says, well, Mr. White can't give us one verse that gives us this canon in Scripture, and that denies sola scriptura, as if it can with some extra biblical revelation. I'm really hoping that Mr. Staples will deal with what I said about the canon in here. I sent him the book. It would be nice if he responds to actually my position instead of a characterization of my position. That would be helpful to all of us here. Answer how the man before Christ, he says, the man knew by keeping tradition. Infallibly? I'd like, to answer, I'd like him to answer, did a man know infallibly as you asked him? He's got two minutes. Why more to do that right now? I already answered that question. And once again, and what I encourage you to do is get the tape, wind it back, and listen to what I said. I already answered it. But now, as far as your question about Philemon, I am not saying the Catholic Church does not say that we create the canon. The Catholic Church recognizes the canon authoritatively. Okay? There is a huge difference. We do not say that Hippo in 393 created the canon. The scripture is inspired, if you say materially, in the order of, of, of being, so to speak. But in the order of knowing, you cannot know that in the way, I mean, m what Mr. White is saying in essence is, well, you just read the Bible and it'll confirm itself in your heart. And lots of people agreed about it in the early church. He gives you his opinion of what the fathers say, his opinion of even though I can show you canons from the early church that disagree with the canon that we accept today in, in the church. Well, we just know today. How do you know? Well, if you read the Bible, and, and Mr. White has said it, when God speaks his word, he doesn't need to show you his business card. In other words, that is no different than the Mormon who said, when he asked, why do you believe? He thinks, oh, I've got a burning in my bosom. Folks, that might be lunch. <laughs> we need, and finally, folks, the reason why we need more than just an authority, even that the saints in the Old Testament had, is because the New Testament is a better covenant established on better promises, and we have a greater authority, so much so that Jesus could say to the church, if they hear you, they hear me. Jesus does not present us with a gospel that Mr. White does. I don't have infallible authority. Oh, I don't have infallible authority. We just get in the scriptures and we dig and we pray to God and we ask God and, and we do the best we can, but I don't have any infallible authority. That's not the authority that Jesus Christ established in the New Testament, folks. He said, if they hear you, they hear me. And Jesus didn't open the floor for discussion when he said, thus saith God, neither does his church. One uh, last question for Mr. Staples, since we began with Mr. White, and uh, then we'll have our 10-minute concluding statements. So sorry we're not able to get to all the questions, but I'm sure that our, Don't speakers, leave before the our speakers will, will, uh, will be uh, very happy to see you afterwards, at least for some time. But there are 10-minute concluding statements from each of our speakers. Yes. Mr. Staples, um, you've made much of the, the fact tonight that um, the reason Protestants are divided is because they don't have a person or a group of persons that they can turn to to say, thus saith the Lord. <laughs> My question is, um, where were these people hiding who were able to, to infallibly end all of these uh, arguments in 1054 where the East split uh, from the West? Well, in fact, if, if you'd uh, pick up, and let me recommend a work to you by Dr. Warren Carroll. It's a, Excellent work. I believe he's going to get in as one of the great historians of our century. He's professor and founder of Christendom College. It's called the, uh, the, the, found, the, the Building, the Founding of Christendom. And if you read, if you are even remotely versed in the history of the church, you see that in fact exactly that happened. That is, the church did in fact deal with every single heresy there was. In fact, uh, Athanasius, whom... Uh, my opponent is so fond of quoting, says that the Council of Nicaea, if I can find the exact quote here, uh, said that the Council of Nicaea gave us, um, the confession arrived at, this is to the bishops of Africa, the confession arrived at at Nicaea was, we say more, sufficient and enough by itself 
for the subversion of all irreligious heresy and for the security and furtherance of the doctrine of the church. When you look at the history of the church, certainly Mr. White will, will, will point out, and folks, I get so tired of hearing, that, and, and please come to our debate on papal infallibility because I get so sick of hearing about Liberius and Vigilius and Honorarius. These things have been answered over and over again until the Lutheran Catholic dialogue, by the way, folks, the largest body of Protestants, Dialoguing with Catholics, the Lutherans have concluded, have agreed and said that those do say nothing about papal infallibility. They have been answered again and again and again. I invite you to, to take a look at Dr. Carroll's book. Take a look at Father Most. You can get a synopsis in a couple of pages. And we'll be happy to sell you the books right here uh, if, if you want them at St. Joseph Radio. But I get so sick of answering these things again and again and again, and I will, but obviously... Uh, I can't do it in a couple of minutes here. So I'm going to uh, charge you with the same charge Mr. White gave you earlier. That is to do your homework, to go home, check out the sources. And here's a novel idea. Go to some Catholic sources. Rather than, I'll tell you what, I get a kick out of this 38-volume set that I'm working my way through right now. It is incredible. The Protestant commentaries that Mr. White relies on and quotes over and over again are some of the most biased anti-Catholic commentaries on the councils that absolutely distort history. Now, Mr. White's going to say, oh, Tim, prove that. Yes. Please well, please. we will. We I'll do will. it right now, Tim. We will debate papal infallibility, and you're all invited to come, and I hope that you will be there. I have three minutes, I think. I would never accuse someone of misrepresenting things without being able to back up what I say. And Mr. Staples doesn't even know what commentaries I use. I'd like to show, ask him to show me one reference right now. Here's the book. I can pass it over to you. To these alleged commentaries. Just one, Tim. Come on, Tim. Just one. You mean to tell me you never the... use these commentaries? They are not commentaries. I have heard... They are texts. You've never used Dr. Percival's commentary? No, You've sir, never I haven't. Used... You've never used any of these commentaries by Philip Schaff or any, any other sir, scholar? Sir, that I, is not a commentary, is it? Those are, those are the documents themselves. I'm talking the footnotes to and I'd the like commentaries made. I'd like you to look at them. These are the Antonicene Fathers. They're available in electronic text in the, in, the, in the web now. You can look at them yourself. You can examine them yourselves. And I quote from the sources. And in fact, frequently, sir, I quote from Minj. Do you read Minj, sir? Patrologia Greci? The Greek resources themselves? TLG, the Tsarist Lingua Greci, mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry, sir, but this constant accusation of misrepresentation without documentation should not be allowed to go by. It's unfair, sir. Now, you say, well, we'll do it someday in the future. Yes, I will. look forward to that, but something tells me that when we get to that debate in the future, we're not going to have, quote, unquote, the time to document all these alleged misrepresentations. Now, allegedly, I've misrepresented Athanasius, and yet it's interesting if you will go home and get volume four of the second series. It's right here in the Antonicene Fathers, and read Athanasius, you'll discover that he defends the Nicene Creed on the basis of Scripture. What's his ultimate authority? Nicaea? No. So do I. It was the Scripture. That is not a lie. That is what... Now, notice, notice something. I defend Mr. Staples, Scripture. Mr. Staples says these things for one reason. Because the church tells him to. He's not acting as a historian right now. He's acting as a faithful son of the church who believes what he's told to believe. And even the church's authority goes to telling him what to believe about history. I'm so sick, he says, of explaining Honorius and Liberius and all the rest of this stuff. Why should he be sick of that? Why should he be sick of it? I've never said I'm sick of explaining all the misrepresentations that Roman Catholic apologists use, the Sola Scriptura. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to get the opportunity of explaining those things. And you see, if you will simply approach Honorius mm -hmm. as the men at Vatican I did who were most into, into history, you'll see why many of them had to leave the church and others just closed their mouths and no longer talked about the things they had talked about beforehand. There are all sorts of errors in regards to papal infallibility and the church's infallibility. But you see, Mr. Staples can't accept any single fact that can be brought against what? His ultimate authority. Did you hear what he said earlier? He slipped up. He said, we have authority that can say, thus saith God, and it's the church. If you say, thus saith God, that makes you the ultimate authority. He just proved sola ecclesia. He just proved my accusation.
We'll have the 10 minute concluding statements, first from Mr. White, then from Mr. Staples, and then our MC will have a few concluding remarks, brief ones, and then uh, a closing prayer. I'd like to immediately end the rumors that there is going to be a wrestling match between myself <laughs> and Mr. Staples after the, um, the event this evening. Thank you for being here. You're the faithful few that survived. There were more here when you started. You notice that? There's a few extra peaks there. My friends, I seek in my closing statements to refocus our attention. I ignore everything else that's come before and try to serve you as best I can as a minister of the gospel to refocus your attention upon why we came here in the first place. Many today seek what I call the infallible fuzzies, the warm, content feeling, a feeling you have infallible truth and everybody else is wrong except you and you've been told by this, this authority to believe these things. They want the infallible fuzzies. Yet every one of us sitting here this evening, and even those who left, is a fallible human being. He may say he can prove things beyond a shadow of a doubt, but he's fallible too. We are all fallen human beings capable of making mistakes in our decisions and our actions. I point out yet again that the decision that Mr. Staples made to embrace the ultimate authority of Rome was a fallible decision. There are many who offer you infallible certainty. Rome, Salt Lake, Brooklyn. That's where the Jehovah's Witnesses are headquartered. But the decision to follow any one of these ultimate authorities is yours. And it's a fallible one. One can never have more infallible certainty than is provided by that first decision to accept that ultimate and highest authority. Mr. Staples' certainty about the doctrines of Roman Catholicism are no more certain than the first decision he made to embrace that authority. You may say, ah, but Mr. White, you told us to be fair. You told us to apply the same arguments to both sides. You, too, have your ultimate authority. You have chosen the Bible. That's correct. You're right, and I'm upfront about it. The difference, however, between Mr. Staples and myself is just this. The Lord Jesus Christ described this book as God speaking in Matthew 22. He subserviated all traditions, even those that claimed to be divine, to it in Mark chapter 7. Peter said holy men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, resulting in this book. And Paul said, it is the very breath of God. It is Theonustos. And the writer of Hebrews, please, please go home. Start at the beginning of Hebrews 4. Mr. Staples only read you what came after. Start at the beginning. Read the context. I think you'll be surprised. Rome is not Theonustos. Rome is not inspired. It is not infallible. History shows us that the tradition that Mr. Staples wishes to bind us to has erred many times. He may be sick of explaining them, and I can understand why. But it has erred all the same. It has erred both in the person of the Pope, such as in the case of Liberius Honorius Sixtus, and a host of others, and in the wider councils, such as when the Council of Constance burned Jan Hus for being an evangelical Christian, or when the Fourth Lateran Council, as we explained earlier, gave indulgences to those who would take up the sword to exterminate heretics, just as the Crusaders did. Mr. Staples' tradition doesn't pass the test of being Theonustos. It isn't infallible. But, as has been demonstrated to a fault this evening, once you accept it for what it is not, you can no longer critically examine it. All facts brought up against that. Oh, there's answers to all that. I know Mormons who say there's answers to everything about the Book of Mormon. Dark and Covers, for great price. Ah, but we can just dismiss them in 15 seconds. Every person in this room this evening must make a decision concerning their ultimate authorities. I choose the God-breathed scriptures. And I stand with Jesus 
Peter, Paul, and all the believers down to the ages who have been led by the Spirit of God to make that choice. You see, if you look at the word theanustas, what's nustas? It comes from neo, to breathe, just like pneuma, the Spirit. And the Spirit of God has never, ever led any person away from the ultimate and unquestioned absolute and final authority of the Word of God, the Scriptures. You have a choice to make, too. God holds every person responsible for His truth. You have the responsibility to handle His truth properly and to obey it. What you will do with that responsibility is up to you. God says in his word that we are to be workmen, rightly handling the word of truth. The responsibility is not placed on just one man or councils of men, but upon each one of us. You can make the choice to hand over your responsibility to someone else, but that does not rid you of that responsibility. If you are misled by that person or church or group or whoever, you will not be able to say in the judgment day, well, God, this person told me to believe that or that person misled me. I'm really innocent. I've made my choice. I'm up front. I've made a decision that this is the infallible rule of faith. How about you? You've heard all sorts of stuff tonight, some of which I don't know is worthy of your being here for. Accusations, counter-accusations, you do this. No, I don't. Yes, you do. I guess that happens in debate. You've unfortunately heard a lot of misrepresentations of what Sola Scriptura means. I hope that as the fervor and the emotion of the evening subside some, we'll have the opportunity of getting the tapes, picking up some books. Hey, Tim even said, buy my book, take his advice. It's one of the things he's been right about tonight. (laughs) It's one of the few, but one of the things he's been right about tonight. And maybe as the emotion subsides and, you know, there's not a bunch of people around, you got a bunch of people going, yeah, clapping, and the other folks, you got two or three, yeah, clapping, that type of thing. Once all that's passed, Maybe you can sit down and think about it and go, you know, I I really thought Sola Scriptura was something that I guess it isn't. How how does my position really respond to what Sola Scriptura really is? And and maybe you'll listen to my opening statements, you'll read the book, and you'll go, wow, I I wonder why so many Catholic apologists uh, use a different definition of Sola Scriptura. You know, there's a lot of quote-unquote Protestant apologists running around who use all sorts of weird definitions about what Roman Catholics believe. And I join with you in saying, hey, that, that's wrong. There's really no need to do that. So why is it that it happens in reverse so much? It shouldn't happen that way. And maybe you'll have the opportunity to think about what Sola Scriptura really is. And you'll be able to realize, you know, Tim says that Mr. White's is trying to shift the burden of proof. That's exactly what Patrick Madrid said in our debate. And yet in reality, remember what the thesis was. Scriptures are the only infallible rule of faith of the church. We both agree they're infallible rules. So what's the key word of the thesis? Only. So where is this other infallible rule? Have you noticed that we we haven't exactly had these doctrines that I've asked to be traced through history traced? Where is this infallible rule of faith? I submit to you that in the final analysis, and I'm in, I'm in a wonderful position here. No matter how hard Mr. Staples tries, every word he says just proves the truthfulness of what I'm saying. In the final analysis, Mr. Staples' reading of Scripture and Mr. Staples' reading of church history is all determined by one thing. Sola Ecclesia. The church tells him, this is what you're supposed to find in the Bible. Lo and behold, he looks at Matthew 16, 18, and there it is. This is what you're supposed to find in the early church. Lo and behold, there it is. That's because it's his ultimate authority. You have to make that decision, too. And I honestly submit to you 
that if you'll go home tonight and read the 119th Psalm, just consider what it says. And think about what we've said tonight and take all the other stuff out of the way. You'll discover that the Holy Spirit of God leads his people to an implicit trust in the final and ultimate authority of his scriptures. Well, I said I wasn't, but I guess I'm going to have to respond to some of these charges that forgive me for getting a little emotional and saying I'm so sick and tired of responding to these charges that have been proven so many times over and over again, not only by Catholics, but by Protestants to be outdated, uh, bigoted attacks on the Catholic Church that are not founded in truth. He mentioned Jan Hus. I answered that on the radio. And any honest assessment of history will tell you the Catholic Church did not burn anyone at the stake. The Catholic Church turned over because, remember, as I said at the outset, we're talking about a culture that believes that mortal sin was a serious, serious crime. In fact, worse than murder. And guess what? I agree with that. Do you agree that mortal sin, something that will kill someone's soul is more serious than what could kill a body? I think many of you agree with that point. And you see, we were talking about a Christian culture that believed that to do that was a capital crime. Did the Catholic Church kill them? No. The Catholic Church was a, a, a voice for mercy, but a voice for truth. And in the case of Jan Hus, she handed him over to secular authority. That is a historical fact. But is that is that a, 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 a proof that the church is not infallible? Absolutely not. That is not an infallible act to start with. That's an act of, for example, in the church today, our Holy Father has said, if bloodless means are possible, we ought to use those. That's a little bit of a, of a shift in our tradition concerning capital punishment. Does that mean we've changed? I'm sure some Protestant apologists are going to be saying that now. Oh, you've changed. No, we haven't changed. We still objectively believe in capital punishment. But the question is whether it is prudent to carry out at the, this moment in time that which certainly Mr. White would agree is taught by God in Scripture. There is a time for capital punishment. If we were to be reduced to anarchy, let's say. And the, the rule of law is dispensed with and we have to rebuild it. Perhaps it would be a good thing to, to encourage the death penalty once again. So Jan Hus is absolutely ludicrous as an, a historical uh, proof that the church is there. Liberius. Pope Liberius, in fact, again, I encourage you to read Dr. Warren Carroll's works on this. Liberius, what in fact he did sign... The Creed of Sirmium, as it's called, or Sirminium, was not heretical. It was ambiguous. And there is no doubt Liberius was, a, was weak. He gave in to the Arians, and he ought not to have, and he also condemned St. Athanasius. But folks, what Mr. White fails to point out to you is that Liberius was a defender of Athanasius until, in fact, he was imprisoned, tortured. He was threatened with loss of life. He didn't mention that part. So you see, a, a pope who acts with a gun to his head, that is not a papal act. Why? Because it must be free in order to be responsible for any moral act. If somebody holds my hand and forces me to pull the trigger, am I going to be culpable? Of course not. Number one, the creed he signed was not, was not, I repeat, was not heretical. And number two, he was forced to sign. He was also forced to condemn Athanasius. Secondly, when in fact, another little fact that my opponent doesn't bring up, when in fact later he was brought another creed that was definitively Arian, he did not sign it. Now, I'm not saying that Liberius was right in signing that first decree. No. 
But I am saying that is not an example of papal error that proves papal infallibility is wrong. Mr. White is wrong. He is doing what I have told you he does with Scripture and the fathers often and misrepresents them. But you examine the facts for yourself. Pope Vigilius, who condemned the famous three chapters, Theodore, Theodore and Ibba Vedessa, he condemned them, yes, he shouldn't have. He didn't want to at the outset. The emperor turned the screws and he signed a condemnation. But guess what? That was not, once again, an infallible act of a pope. But secondly, there was nothing wrong in what he signed. Why? Because all three of them were heretics. But two of them had recanted and come back to the faith. So the pope did not want to condemn them. But because of the force of the emperor, he was forced to. Honorary, I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm about out of time. We could do the same thing with honoraries and all these other charges. But I want to close, folks, with de by demonstrating to you, number one, he has never answered the original charge to show me in Scripture. He believes in sola scriptura, not me. Where does the Bible say, where does the Bible teach that we have 27 books in the New Testament? Mr. White has to go to tradition outside of the, the canon, of, outside of Scripture in order to prove the point. Secondly, he cannot give me what are the essentials of the Christian faith in the Scripture. He never responded to that. Why? He can't. Why? Because if he did, you would be shocked at what he says. Because he would disagree with the majority of you, my Protestant friends. And you would see how much confusion there is in Protestantism. Let me close with uh, St. Augustine, whom my opponent has quoted and uses as an example of, of, a, of a good Protestant who holds to sola scriptura. And I'm quoting from St. Augustine uh, against the Manichaeans. There are many other things which most justly keep me in the Catholic Church. The consent of peoples and nations keeps me in the church. So does her authority, inaugurated by miracles, nourished by hope, enlarged by love, established by age. The succession of priests keeps me, beginning from the very seat of the Apostle Peter, to whom the Lord, after his resurrection, gave it in charge to feed his sheep down to the present episcopate. Boy, that sounds Protestant. Perhaps you will read the gospel to me and will attempt to find there a testimony to Manichaeus. But should you meet with a person not yet believing the gospel, how would you reply to him were he to say, I do not believe? That's what we've been debating tonight, folks. How would you respond? I don't know if I'm going to believe that gospel. And someone asked me that question earlier. Well, listen to St. Augustine, this supposed Protestant, sola scriptura uh, adherence, and how his response is. For my part, I should not believe the gospel except as moved by the authority of the Catholic Church. So when those in it, on whose authority I have consented to believe in the gospel tell me not to believe in Manichaeus, how can I but consent? I encourage you to read John Calvin's commentary on this in the Institutes, in Calvin's Institutes. I encourage you to read that and then read it in context and you will see the length that Mr. White, John Calvin, and others will go to dismiss what is the obvious words of St. Augustine here. Listen. Mr. White asks us to make a choice. Listen to what Augustine says. So when those on authority I have consented to believe in the gospel tell me not to believe in Manichaeus, how can I but consent? Take your choice. If you say believe the Catholics, their advice to me is put no faith in you. That believing them, I am precluded from believing you. If you say, do not believe the Catholics, you cannot fairly use the gospel in bringing me to faith in Manichaeus. For it was at the command of the Catholics that I believed the gospel. But if happily you should succeed in finding in the gospel an incontrovertible testimony to the apostleship of Manichaeus, you will weaken my regard for the authority of the Catholics who bid me not to believe in you. And the effect of that will be that I should no longer be able to believe the gospel either. For it was through the Catholics that I got my faith in it. And so whatever you bring from the gospel will no longer have any weight with me. Therefore, 
If no clear proof of the apostleship of Manichaeus is found in the gospel, I will believe the Catholics rather than you. But if you read then some passage clearly in favor of Manichaeus, I will believe neither them nor you. Not them, for they lied to me about you. Nor you, for you quote me the scripture that I had believed on those liars, on the authority of those liars. And we could go on, folks. But I'm going to suggest to you, folks, Mr. White and the Protestants have, and, and I would say he is very good at it, quoting fathers of church like St. Augustine. You heard him quote St. Augustine earlier. You heard him quote St. Athanasius, and I refuted those quotes. And we could go down, and we could go to Christmas and all the others, but the bottom line is this, folks. You do have to make a choice. The church of the New Testament is not the Protestant church that is 26,000 denominations in utter confusion and chaos over the central things, salvation. The church of the New Testament, folks, is a church that speaks for Jesus, and that means has authority. Not, well, I don't have infallible authority. I don't know. I'm out of time. Thank you all. I want to thank you for, for sticking through all this. And, and please forgive me. Those of you that are present, please understand. My passion is for the truth. And I, and I want to see, especially those of you who have left the Catholic faith, please come back to the Eucharist, which is, which is our salvation.